My name is Jeffrey Tucker. I'm working for the Mises Institute, and we're doing a series of, of small videos, short videos, on our new book, Economics in One Listen. It's, of course, not a new book. It's a very old book by Henry Hazlitt. And it's my great pleasure to sit here with the, uh, with the scholar who wrote the introduction to the book, Walter Block. I'm delighted to be here with you, Jeff. It's just wonderful. So how do you think the book turned out? Do you like to look at it? Oh, wow. It's, it's uh, a labor of love. It's magnificent. Uh, this is one of my very favorite books of all bookdom, so to speak, and uh, it looks very good. I'm delighted that I was asked to write the introduction. And uh, I looked at it again, and I was amazed yeah. that me and Henry Hazlitt are now buddies. <laughs> it's just magnificent. So I was uh, so inspired by your last paragraph of your introduction. Do you mind if I read it, please? Yeah. And this takes away all your, your good stuff for this interview. But <clears throat> And so, here we go. Okay. In summary, I feel like a party host in introducing two guests to one another uh, who, hope, who hopes they will like each other. I hope you will like this book, but more, I hope it will affect your life in somewhat the same way it has mine. It has inspired me to promote economic freedom. Indeed, to never shut up about it. <laughs> yeah, very funny. It has convinced me that free market economics is as beautiful in its way as a prism a diamond, a sunset, the smile of a baby. We're talking the verbal equivalent of Mozart or Bach here. This book lit up my life, and I hope you get something a lot from it, too. So that's a very nice paragraph. Oh, you're very kind. Thanks. Uh, uh, that came right from the heart. Uh, I yeah. meant every word of it. Uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, this laissez-faire capitalism, free market, it's so unlikely to occur. I mean, you know, you've got Obama and you've you got McCain, and neither of them are laissez-faire economist types. And, we're, and poor Ron Paul, who is, uh, you know, was given the back of the hand by the American electorate. And they say, well, you know, it's so impractical. And one of my retorts, I have many, is that it's so beautiful. And even if it's never implemented, it's just so glorious, the, the idea of it. It's sort of like, I mean, I love Mozart and Bach, but I couldn't compose anything like that. And, and I couldn't appreciate, I'm not, I'm not a professional musician, but to me, Mozart and, and Bach and um, Hazlitt and Mises and Rothbard are all intertwined. They're, they're, even though, obviously, there are differences. Some work in words, others work in musical notes. But I see, uh, weirdo that I am, I see uh, great uh, connections between them. And I'm just honored to have been able to devote my professional life to creating beautiful music with words. Right. Now, there are obviously other retorts. Um, more practical ones. For example, no one expected the Berlin Wall to topple when it toppled. No one expected the Soviet Union to go belly up when it went belly up. And if we didn't have a plan as to how to privatize and how the market would work, it's as if we'd be caught with our pants down around our ankles. So even though right now in the U.S. things look gloomy for free enterprise, you know, Ron Paul experience, what have you, he didn't win, so far anyway, we can always hope. Uh, Maybe one day the uh, the Washington D.C. wall will fall, yeah. uh, similar to the Berlin Wall, and unless and until we have some sort of uh, understanding of free market economics, uh, we will be greatly embarrassed. Why do you suppose we need a book like this to help us understand economics? Well, this I think is the best introduction to economics of our type, Austro-Libertarian economics. I I know of no better introduction. I know of better um, uh, essays or uh, long written works like Human Action and Economy and State, but those are five, six, seven hundred uh, pages. This is I don't know, uh, 150 pages or something yeah, like that. How many pages is it? Let's see. Uh, it's 188. 89, and that includes the index. Okay, so yeah. without the index in my introduction, 150 isn't yeah. too far off. Maybe it's 170. So you can give it to someone and say, look, uh, read this as your first book. This is my first book in economics. Um, I was converted to uh, libertarianism by Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brandon. And Nathaniel Brandon, most of all, gave me two books. And he said, read these two books, and then we'll discuss them. Uh -huh. And one was this one, Economics in One Lesson. The other was Atlas Shrugged. Uh -huh. And in my introduction economics classes, I give my students what I was given. And 
it worked for me and and has worked for some of my students. Some of my students really get the message, and I think they get it from um, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. So why is it that people can't just intuitively figure out economic science by looking oh, around the world? Oh, oh no! I think that their intuitions are very much the opposite. Mm. Uh, every freshman class I get. Uh, when I say that the minimum wage law is not really a good thing for the poor, they think I'm callous and unfeeling, because obviously you raise the minimum wage and everyone's better off. And and you know it's sort of like uh, the Grinch that stole Christmas to to oppose that, um, or rent rent control lowers rents for poor people, and who could be against that? So instinctively, good kids, 17, 18, 19 year old freshmen, they're filled with the milk of human kindness. And they want uh, they want the poor to be helped, but they don't realize that uh, it it doesn't work. Now, could you uh, call upon that Pythagorean thing that you read oh, yeah. to me before well, we started out with you? Because that's very apropos to the point that I'm trying oh, to make. Oh, I'll probably never be able to find oh. it. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah, no, it's right here. Okay, right good. Here. So, yeah, so how's this talking about? Um, uh, well, about the Bastiat lesson concerning what you can see and what you can't see and how you can't always trust what you see. So he, he says, as a character in Bernard Shaw's St. Joan replies when told of the theory of Pythagoras that the earth is round and revolves around the sun. What an utter fool. Couldn't he use his eyes? Right. Sometimes, I mean, I think that's a beautiful passage and it really illustrates the, my answer to your question about uh, young students and why do they have why do they need this book why don't they instinctively see it their instincts are the very much opposite as it is I mean it looks as if the Sun revolves around the earth I mean it starts in the east and it goes to the west I mean, can't you use your eyes you dummy yeah. <laughs> you, know, you should be able to see that well in a similar way you have to do more than your eyes or more than a superficial look at minimum wage, at rent control, at tariffs and free trade and all the other issues that Hazlitt uh, goes through to see uh, beneath the surface. Yeah. And I think also socio-biologically we all are hardwired to accept explicit cooperation. You know, you're hurt, I'll, I'll soothe you, I'll, I'll get a cold compress oh. for you, what have you. But implicit cooperation through markets uh -huh. We're not uh, hardwired through biology to accept that. The uh, best example I can think of is I, I come from New Orleans. I teach at Loyola University, and we had Katrina. And right after Katrina, the prices rose of flashlight batteries and uh, candles and uh, orange juice and things like that. And everyone was saying, oh, they're price gougers, they're evil, uh, instinctively. Yeah. And when the governor of the state of Louisiana said, I'm going to put price gougers in price gougers in jail everyone said yeah right on you know put those uh, so-and-so's in, into jail it takes economics of the sort that economics in one lesson provides you to understand that there's a function of higher prices namely it, it rations goods and it calls forth new supplies otherwise all we can rely on is benevolence we, we can't rely on self-interest but most people are not hardwired to see that. They can't appreciate implicit cooperation, namely through prices and markets and profits and property rights and things like that. All they can uh, instinctively appreciate is charity. Yeah. Okay, so Walmart brings in a whole bunch of things. That's good. Uh, uh, that would be like seeing the, the sun going, you know, uh, around the earth, or, or rather, <laughs> the earth going around the sun. So. I think the answer to your question is that people instinctively are anti-market yeah. and it takes an effort of will or understanding or knowledge of the sort that Henry Hazlitt so magnificently supplies to pierce through this ignorance. So let me ask about that. Why is it that there's only one economics and one lesson? Why is it, is it very difficult to write a book like this, a clean, clear, timeless introduction to economics. Why is that so difficult? Well, I think there are many. Uh, David Gordon has an introduction to yeah. economics. I think Callahan has one. There are others, but you know, uh, it's sort of like, why is there only one Mozart or one Bach? Well, there are others. I mean, yeah. there is Haydn and Salieri. Hegel, <laughs> Salieri. I mean, there are, uh, my own book, uh, Defending the Undefendable, uh -huh. is sort of an homage to this. Sure. Uh, uh, at least the way I see it, uh, what they both have in common, and I'm not comparing the quality, but uh, just the, the motif, both have a, a main message and then 30 implications. Yes. For example, his main message is the lesson, my main message is the law of non-aggression, 
and then we both apply it to 30 places. So in a sense, when I wrote my book, Defending the Undefendable, I had this one in mind, right. only it was my seeing it through my eyeglasses. Now obviously the, these two books don't deserve to be mentioned even in the same sentence, but uh, but you know, if there's a Mozart and a Salieri, there can be a Hazlitt and a Block. I mean, yeah. all you can do is do your best. Yeah. And there are many of us at the Mises Institute right now, the, the faculty, uh, 12 of us or so, we're all trying to contribute. Now, none of us is a Hazlitt, none of us is a, Mozart, is a Mozart or or a Mises or a Rothbard, but we're all doing our best and we're trying to uphold the um, the tradition. But how do you account for why the book still seems so fresh, even though it was written so long ago? In my introduction, what I said is that except for that crack about Eleanor Roosevelt, yeah. uh, it, it looks as if it was ripped from today's headlines. Yeah, and, and if he would have just put Hillary instead of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, you, you probably couldn't tell. I mean, the book first came out in, in 46. 46, yeah. And now it's uh, 2008. Uh, I think that's 52 years or something, or 62 yeah. years, 72 years. My math is a little weak. It's a long time. It's almost a hundred, soon it'll be 100 years. And that book will be as fresh in 2042 yeah. as it was in 1946. And apparently, uh, he, just, he just ripped it off. I mean, not ripped it off. He just banged it out. I yeah. Mean, he, he left the New York Times yeah. in a split. And he just sat down at the typewriter and wrote this out as, uh, and uh, didn't think anything much would come of it. Isn't that interesting? Well, he was inspired, maybe. Yeah. Uh, maybe he was channeling something higher than him. Who knows? I, I'm not a religious person, but uh, he might have been inspired or something. Yeah. Uh, it's just beautiful. You know, f forget about the content for the moment. I mean, the content is beautiful. Uh, it's perfect. There's no mistake. But the way he writes, I mean, uh, he was inspired. I mean, it's just so beautiful, just on an aesthetic basis, apart from the economic basis. Yeah. It's so well written. I mean, there are very few people who can write like that. Murray Rothbard was one. But the rest of us lesser beings, you know, uh, convoluted sentences, and it's hard to understand, and relatively speaking, yeah. uh, to these uh, geniuses. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things we had in mind when we put out the introduction is we wanted to make it a beautiful book, yeah. hardback, yes. and cheap. Yes. So, I don't know, maybe this has happened to you, but oftentimes I'll have people over to dinner, just guess, and we'll, the subject of economics will come up. And you don't want to waste the whole dinner talking about economic theory. Um, what? So what? Well, <laughs> oh, you do? How dare you? How dare you say that? <laughs> no, you do want to do that, right? Okay. Let's say you do, but you want to give them even more. I've always wanted to have a, a stack of these yes, in my house. Yes, so I can say, sure. oh, by the way, here, let me yeah. just, oh, please take it. Take it with you. Yeah. And so that's the idea, you know, is that you can have, you can own some and give them up. Lou Rockwell gave a brilliant speech at one of the uh, Mises uh, seminars. I forget in what city. I, I've been to so many, they all blend together. And what he said is you're at a dinner party and everyone's nice and everyone's talking about, you know, the weather or the, the sports or something. And all of a sudden someone says something like, you know, uh, we got to have protective tariffs. And, and, and you know, you, your uh, spoon is halfway to your uh, mouth and you sort of, uh, what? And I, I think that would be a perfect antidote to that. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't have to, um, what's the expression, don't get mad, get even? <laughs> <laughs> don't lose your soup uh, halfway to your lip, but uh, just resolve that after the dinner is over, uh, you say, you know, you might be interested in this book. Yeah. And if you've got a stack of them, and what do they sell for? Uh, I think it's tw like $12. $12. Well, at today's prices, that's like uh, three gallons of gas or something, you know. You, you can give them, not promiscuously, but, you know, uh, on a needed basis. Right, once you see a spark of interest and say, right. well, here's, here's an issue you need to confront, which is namely, right. namely economic logic. Yeah, and yes. And you can, you can uh, hold whatever political views you want, but you need to think about, think about the economics behind it. Yeah, another title for that book that would have been good would have been Economic Logic in One Lesson. Yeah. Uh, if you wanted other titles that would be equally good or yeah. roughly yeah. as good. I mean, I, I'm not changing the title, I'm not for that, but Economic logic, I think, is a very good way of putting it. Do you suppose that it's one of the best-selling economics books that's ever been printed? I think it is. Uh, uh, I, I know that um, Atlas Shrugged is um, a magnificent yeah, bestseller, sure. and sure. it came out in '56, mm. and it's still selling yeah. by the bushel load. 
Uh, but it's not really an economics book, although it is, but it's a novel. But this is a, a, not a novel, and, and Hazlitt has written novels. Yes. Uh, this is just a, a textbook, a very short textbook. I use it uh, in my classes as an adjunct to uh, you know, a mainstream textbook and you know, say, here's the, the good stuff. And a lot of times this attracts the student interest in a way that the dry textbook uh, It's nice doesn't. to compare them, isn't it, to have yes. them both? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Walter, for not only for writing the introduction, but for agreeing to this uh, quick interview. Oh, it's my pleasure, Jeff. Ready for part two of our series, yeah. and I'm here with uh, Thomas D. Lorenzo from Loyola University in oh, yeah. Baltimore, and uh, we're going to get into the very heart of the book, Economics in One Lesson. Now here with you, but I'd like to just read this one sentence and ask you to defend it here. He says, uh, "It is often sadly remarked that the bad economists present their errors to the public better than the good economists present their truths." What do you think about that? Yeah was talking about the broken window fallacy, I assume, in that, that, that passage. Right. And, uh, and uh, that's, you can't really be an economist or think like an economist unless you understand the broken window fallacy, I think, uh, which is the essence of opportunity cost. And uh, one way I uh, explain it to uh, my classes is, you know, I teach at a Catholic university, and, they're, uh, and they're, we're always encouraging students to engage in some sort of community service. So I tell the, the class that um, the economics department has a, a, our own version of community service. We're going to buy each of you an aluminum baseball bat, and we're all going to march down North Charles Street, which is the main street north and south in uh, Baltimore. We're going to bash in all the windows of the cars all the way down, and it's a job creation program. That's our community <laughs> service, I tell them. And uh, then I ask them, what, what kind of jobs do you think we'll create in the city of Baltimore? We'll reduce unemployment, we'll, we'll reduce poverty. And, uh, and they scratch their heads for a minute, and they, well, glass repair, garbage collection, uh, extra uh, private security guards, and, they, and I write down on a blackboard a list of all the jobs we're going to create. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I ask them, well, well, why don't we burn down some buildings on the way? And that, that'll <laughs> well, create even more of a world. We'll stuff. eliminate poverty <laughs> altogether, won't we? And then they start thinking about it. Well, wait a minute, there's something wrong here about, about this. And, uh, and, so, and if they've already read sort of the theory of opportunity cost, they'll catch on that, uh, of course, that's what's seen. Those jobs are seen, the, uh, the, the uh, glass repairmen and all that. But what is not seen is all the resources that had to be transferred from somewhere else or reallocated uh, and jobs destroyed there so that we can fix up the glass and hire the security guards and so forth. And so the whole key to thinking like an economist really is to think about uh, what is not seen as well as uh, what is seen in the words of... Uh, the immortal Friedrich Bastiat. Right. Well, uh, and yet it seems like um, it would be something easy to understand once you hear the story sure. uh, of the of the broken window and to understand the fallacy and perhaps to see what's wrong with it. If that's so, why is it so persistent? I think uh, economic miseducation has a lot to do with it. I think uh, economists, especially uh, including uh, academic economists when they teach, are so enamored with uh, mathematics and model building that they, they ignore or downplay uh, the, really the, the basic fundamental truths of economics, like opportunity cost, because it's so mundane. It's not, uh, you can't really model it or can't express it in mathematics that well. And they, they tend to forget about it. And then students who take uh, classes, they might learn these sophisticated models, but they don't learn uh, really basic economics. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's why the Austrian School of Economics has so, always been so appealing to me. It's always been uh, rooted in understanding how the economic world works as opposed to showing off your math skills. Right. And I, I think the economic miseducation uh, is the main reason why so many people and members of the public uh, don't get this real simple idea. So opportunity costs are always invisible, so they don't show up in the economic data. Right. right? So um, Not always. Sometimes they, some of them do. 
And this is makes makes it less interesting than for an empirical economist, right? Uh, yeah, on the, on the empirical on the empirical side, uh, have the old joke about the economist uh, uh, looking for his watch across the street when he knew he lost it on the other side of the street, and when he's asked uh, why are you looking for your watch over there when you know you lost it over here, and he says the light is better over there. Uh, the, that's very true about economists because when they undergo their research, they're, if they do empirical research, they're limited by what kind of data they can get. Even though there are very important questions that need to be asked and addressed uh, that you just can't measure uh, empirically all the time. And so they tend to ignore these things. And, uh, and so, uh, so there's a lot of truth to that old joke about, yeah. about the economist and his watch. So Hazlitt calls this chapter two, after he explains the lesson, he calls it the blessings of destruction. Right. But he, uh, he talks a lot about war uh, and the, the idea that things such as uh, war uh, can be good for the economy, war prosperity, you ever heard that phrase. And, uh, and of course, uh, some people do become wealthy through war, the people who sell munitions to the government and, and so forth. That's what's seen, you see that. But then once again, uh, uh, what is not seen is all the resources that are taken out of the pockets of the taxpayers to pay for it. And also, another slightly more sophisticated part of this is that uh, you know the market system is uh, one big network uh, that displays the international division of labor, and it's peaceful and cooperative. We work together to produce goods and services, and we buy and sell from one another. War is just the opposite. War is blowing things up and destroying things and killing people, and so the idea, the very idea that war can produce prosperity in any sense, is absurd on the face of it. And uh, Henry Hazlitt explains that as, as simply and as straightforwardly as uh, anybody I've ever, I've ever read in just a, a couple of paragraphs, really. And von Mises does a great job of that also in, in Human Action in his uh, chapter on war and the economy. It's also true with uh, uh, natural disasters. Right. We played this game on the Mises blog. Anytime right. there's a fire or a flood or anything, we do see how, how many days it'll be before a professional economist yeah. makes a statement. To yeah, we press. always end up digging up an article from the New York Times or the LA Times, somewhere of some some pseudo economist saying, "Well, the bright side is that <laughs> it's good for the economy." In fact, there was an earthquake in Southern California yesterday, yeah. as we sit here at the Mises Institute on July 30th. And uh, sure enough, you're, you're, I bet uh, yeah, tomorrow, if we look at it, if we do a web search, we'll find a statement like this of, of thank goodness in this time of, of the housing crisis and the, the subprime crisis and we're in a recession, God sent us an earthquake in Southern <laughs> California. Somebody's going to say something like that. And, uh, and uh, when they do, I think we should send that person a copy of Economics in One Lesson. Whatever reporter we discover uh, says that thing. So do you find that you're teaching? Uh, in your intro introductory classes, consists of, of just day after day of applying this lesson. In oh yeah, ways. yeah, yeah. Not even not just introductory classes. Mm -hmm. I, I taught a new course I put together called the Political Economy of War, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know the, the very first week of readings involved uh, the broken window fallacy and uh, Ludwig von Mises on war and the economy, in which he elaborates on the broken window fallacy, among other things. So a real basic economics uh, that can, uh, to get you to think about the economic consequences of, of war, and is certainly uh, uh, the broken window fallacy is, is certainly one of them. Yeah. Uh, do you think this new edition will be helpful to you? Uh, oh yes, it's a beautiful edition, and it's, it's uh, priced very well, and uh, congratulations on uh, being able to do that. And, uh, and I'm, I'm sure I'll be buying box loads of them because I always have. For 20 years, I've been buying copies of Economics in One Lesson because as, a, as an economics professor, I run into people all the time who ask me, uh, what one book can I read that's not too complicated and technical, a lot of math, uh, and understand economics? And right. Economics in One Lesson is that book. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dr. This is Jeffrey Tucker at the Mises Institute. I'm sitting here with Jeffrey Herbener of Grove City College. He's agreed to talk to us about a couple of chapters from this book, Economics in One Lesson, our new edition. And um, 
uh, the book is now about 62 years old, and it still holds up. Yeah, it's great. It's a fabulous book. Everyone's uh, first introduction to sound economics still. After Do you use years. it at uh, Grove City? Uh, we use it at uh, Grove City. We uh, have a course in public policy, and so it uh, provides the first introduction to sound thinking on public policy. You mean that uh, the all students um, take a public policy course in uh, addition to an economics class? The econ, uh, no, it would be mainly econ majors or majors okay. in political science and history, those that are interested in policy questions. Do they take an Economics 101 class before they take public yes. policy? Yes, yes, they so, do. Um, but why wouldn't you use it in, in 101? Why wouldn't we use it right. in 101? In 101, we want to, well, we would use it. I mean, it would be up to the professor's discretion to use it on questions of, uh, relevant questions of policy that come up. I see. Uh, yeah, but it's not, uh, it's not like a um, theoretic, you know, it's not a sort of praxeological theoretical uh, development uh, in the book. It's, it's the lesson and then the application. Right. So it's, it's a succinct, you know, it's a very nice, succinct uh, statement of the lesson that's uh, excellent for applications once you get to that point in, in the see. principal's class. I see. So, um, <clears throat> so you, but you're thinking about students as learning um, a sort of uh, more conventional technical, uh, technical economics? More of a, uh, right, say in a 101 class, uh -huh. right, we, we just began and develop uh, economic theory from pra micro praxeological, economics. yes, yeah. in microeconomics. Okay. And then w once in a micro class, you get to the questions of policy, the middle part of the class or toward the end, then Hazlitt's book would be uh, okay. So a very when deep. most people think about economics and its relevance today, uh, they're thinking about that second step. Uh, that's right. Yeah, because that's the economics we encounter sure. day to day. When we pick up the newspaper, we're not right. reading about a uh, theory of marginal utility. Exactly right. right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is exactly the sort of thing that the non-economist student um, uh, confronts when they uh, think about uh, public policy. Right. They and have to confront this. Big lesson, yeah. and, it, and if they don't get the lesson, they're just uh, awash in all sorts of nonsense. Yeah, uh, and yet you learn a lot of economic theory. Would oh, you say absolutely. That? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah, and so the topic we're discussing now uh, concerns public works and right. and taxes. And taxes. Okay, right. so let's talk about the first chapter. It's uh, mm -hmm. uh, public and public works. Right. Mm -hmm. So in, in this chapter, what uh, Hazlitt does is. Uh, uh, develop a, a sort of extended argument about public works. He says, he says, look, many people say the justification for public works isn't uh, isn't the grandeur of the thing that's produced. It's that it provides employment. So we can justify the building of a bridge or uh, the building of uh, str streets or uh, buildings and so on on the grounds that this provides uh, employment to people. And, of course, the point he's making is that this is always diversion, right? We're always just... We're simply diverting employment from one area to another precisely because the expenditures to build the public works require taxation. And so we're just funneling, right, shifting the resource use. And uh, again, this, is, this basic notion of scarcity and the reallocation of things is totally lost on, on non-economists or those who aren't introduced to right. economic, uh, economic reasoning. Right. And so it's a, it's a wonderful uh, point. So this is 1946. Um, and very fresh in his mind is the experience of uh, the New Deal right. and World War II. <clears throat> and right, this is exactly. a very common argument. It, it is very common. Uh, it gives the example of the, uh, the TVA, one of the uh, public works projects of, uh, yeah, that he uh, uses a, to illustrate his point. Right. Yeah, so. he talks about the... Uh, the grandeur of the wonderful uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah big the, 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 the dams and, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. and all the things wonderful things generated from this electricity and this is what you see this is what you see but yeah you, you do not see the diversion right what's what has been diverted from yeah and of course he doesn't really to make his point this is the beauty of Hazlitt's uh, writing he doesn't really have to go deeply into the sort of theoretical background sort of uh, what's behind the uh, weighing of the different uh, values of things that are produced in one area of the economy relative to another in order to drive this point home. So you don't find extended discussions about, you know, entrepreneurial calculation and, uh, right. you know, how a profit has to be the test of whether or not the thing is justified and so on and so forth to, to see that, that he's right about that. Yeah. And yet it does strike you as somewhat absurd. 
that uh, bureaucrats could decide, well, you know, yeah, we need, a, we need a, an enormous right. dam over there that way. <laughs> that's you know, right, that's right. Or we need a highway here. We know, that's know, right. I mean, how do we know these things? Yeah. Uh, how do we know? Yeah, yeah. but he, he, uh, he raises this question. And he, he, he sort of, his rhetoric is sort of, um, uh, you know, we always dwell just only upon the thing that we see, and we ignore the thing that we do not see. What, what happens to our analysis if we include the thing we do not see? Right. And he just you know, leaves it like, leaves it at that point. Right? Now, it's not deeply. so much uh, an argument you hear these days, is it, that public works are necessary to employ no. people. You don't hear it that much. No. You do sometimes. It's more sector specific, like, well, here's a population that's sort of sort of distressed in some way. In the right. Day, but uh, it's not a macro. No, you're right about that. Yeah. yeah, like you said before, it's in the context of the uh, Depression. Yeah. And they're and just thinking about it. It's because unemployment is, is so low now. Right. right. And yet, you know, the, the magazines and newspapers are filling up now with the. Um, News of the impending uh, movement towards national service, ah, right? Ah, very true. Yeah. yeah, and so the idea is that you you just enslave people between really? the age of eighteen right. and, and twenty, right? Or twenty one or twenty two. <laughs> but you have to, um, and I guess this argument in some way impacts on this, doesn't it? Leaving aside sure. human rights considerations. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> yes, there's the econo- the mundane economic aspect. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'll right. make, um, apply it to that. So that would be the diversion again, right? Uh-huh. So we see what what the uh, public service would be done by this conscripted labor. But we don't see the value of the uh, alternative. And of course, uh, you know, when we think more uh, deeply about it, we, we realize that, again, here's a, a question of entrepreneurship, of the individual's entrepreneurial choice to say, I, in my own mind, can weigh these alternatives. Should I you know, work in a soup kitchen for the summer? Should I... Uh, volunteer for the Peace Corps? Uh, uh, should I go into business and uh, become an entrepreneur? Should I uh, go to a graduate school and uh, extend my education and so on? Yeah. That the per- uh, individual person is perfectly capable of making this decision based upon his own entrepreneurial ability. Can you imagine what it will mean <clears throat> for national productivity, if you care about that kind of thing, to, to rob the, uh, yeah. the economy of, of two or three years it's amazing. Uh, of young people's lives? Yeah. Get them, you know, Away from webmastering and right. gaining skills in the private sector. No, it's, it's have horrible. Them doing what? Yeah, yeah, who knows what, right? That's, who that's knows the what? scary part, right? Yeah. I mean, what, who knows what? Yeah. It could be anything. It's right, whatever, right. They, whatever the politicians dream up. Dream right? up, and they and they uh, dream a lot. Yeah, <laughs> they all have a dream. They all become spies. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's that's the idea. Make sure we we support homeland security or whatever the thing is. Um, now, the next chapter deals with taxes, and it's, and it's a topic on which you've written. Um, and uh, the title is Taxes Discourage Production, mm-hmm. which, once you hear that those three words, it sounds unobjectionable. And yet it requires some fleshing out, doesn't it? Right. And uh, what, what Hassel says in this chapter is, uh, again, the repetition and or application of the basic lesson. So, yes, so we have this uh, case, you know, where the subsidy is provided to someone and everybody says hurrah and look at the wonderful thing that's been done by the state and uh, how it's uh, benefited uh, the recipient, person A, let's say. But they totally ignore, I mean, they realize that taxes have been raised uh, to pay for this, but they ignore the effect on the behavior of B, the state of uh, condition that B is in, right? They, They dwell upon the condition of A, the improved allegedly improved condition of A. Yeah. And so he simply says, well, look, let's consider this. What, what happens when you tax uh, uh, the productivity of uh, the productive uh, output of someone? Well, well they're not going to just sit still for this, right? This changes their behavior. Just like the subsidy changes the behavior of A, presumably for the better, but not right. obviously necessarily. Now, why can't you, why can't you just say, well, um, actually, you, uh, when you tax people, it's true that it takes away some of their money, but that fact alone encourages people to work even more, so become more even more productive to make up for the difference. <laughs> well, well, uh, yeah, people do kind of cl- try to claim this, but of course, uh, this is sort of a confusion of the notion of productivity, right? What exactly do we mean by productivity? We're producing value. Okay, so what is the value that we're producing? Who decides on what is a valuable thing to be produced? And of course, this is the producer. This is Hazel's point, right? What, What's being produced is what the producer himself deems to be valuable. 
And so if he's, a, you know, he runs a business and he's not being taxed or he's being taxed lightly and so he's producing goods in his business and selling them, okay, so he's choosing this as the valuable alternative and he's uh, having it ratified by the purchase of the consumers and so on. So if he's taxed and he does something else, so now his product, you know, he lessens his productivity in this area and he, uh, instead he uh, paints or whatever, then, uh, well, of course, this is something that he himself deems less valuable. He's doing this only as, again, a diversion of... And so his productivity is uh, is uh, diverted. I if he works harder in his business to produce extra income to make up for this, he once again is diverting yeah. right, from things that he personally considers more valuable into Leisure less value. Time, uh, yeah. so, so the objective the objective features of what he does in his action aren't definitive in determining what is product uh, produ production or what is productivity. This can only be determined in the value sense. And this cost. is what's being, yeah, 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 yeah diverted. Well, so why why isn't it a good argument then to say, um, let's not tax productivity, let's tax consumption? Right. Well, this is Rothbard's great contribution, right, in uh, tax uh, incidence theory, where he pointed out that all taxes are in fact income taxes. So if you tax consumption, that tax gets imputed back to production. In other words, a businessman who... You mean on, all taxes are taxes on production? On production, what did yeah, I say? Income. Well, they're, uh, Same uh, thing. Yeah, the, okay. well, in, when I, in the context of our discussion, we can treat that as the same okay. thing. Yeah, they're taxes on wealth, or, okay. uh, things produced, right? Okay. Okay, so yeah, so the idea would be if you, if you tax consumption, you have a sales tax, or you have a general sales tax, or an excise tax, or something like this, that uh, once again, it's the entrepreneur who decides how to adjust to this. He isn't a passive... Uh, recipient of the taxation or payer of it, he adjusts his production. And what he does, of course, is of necessity, he, is, since his costs are raised by the taxes, he has to lower his costs in other areas. This means lessening his demand for labor, shrinking back his capital expenditures, and so on. Yeah. So this falls upon someone's income, some producer's productivity is impacted by this. Yeah. So there's no way to tax no, uh, that's right. consumption. No. Really. Ta consumption cannot be taxed. It can't be taxed. No. It can't be. Only, only things produced, only wealth, only income. But it's often said that, um, well, if, if we tax, uh, uh, put a sales tax on uh, beer or cigarettes mm -hmm. or whatever the thing happens to be, then the producer's not paying and it's only the consumer. And then that, that becomes voluntary because then you can choose not to purchase it. This is a very... Yeah, I once, I once had this conversation actually at an academic conference with a... I would presented something on taxation, and I was making this previous point that we made about taxes being imputed backwards. Yeah. And he said, "No, no." He made exactly your point, right? No, no, no. Wait a minute. What, isn't this just sort of uh, voluntarily paid by the consumer? And I said, "Sure, I'll, right. This is Rothbard's point too, right? A consumer voluntarily pays the full price, and all the costs of production, including taxes, are taken out of this, so to speak, or covered by that revenue for the entrepreneur. It's the entrepreneur who's being coerced." Yeah. Right? He, he's the one who is in, you know, who's, uh, fills the hand of the state, pressing yeah. upon him to take his income. Right. <clears throat> and then his behavior changes. So, and so it's, it's, with, without the hand of the state here, he, he's, his production decisions are different, and prices are mitigated, and uh, supplies are increased, and incomes are higher, and so on. Yeah. yeah. Now, whenever I've... Um, well, let me ask you this. When you present to your students various arguments about the impact of taxes mm -hmm. on uh, economic growth. Uh, does anybody ever raise their hand and say, well, Professor Herbener, what do you propose, how do you propose taxes be structured in a way that uh, will not be damaging? Right. Uh, in fact, I, I teach the course in public finance uh -huh. at Grove City College. And so we, I, so I kind of avoid this um, this line of uh, questioning, by beginning at the very starting point of analysis, to take students through step by step, um, you know, the mar production on the market and so on and so forth, and then the theories of market failure and what have you, so that by the time we get to the point where we're discussing the taxation and the transfers of resources, they've been disabused of the notion that, look, the government has to have a certain tax base in order to provide this or that particular good, 
uh, or set of goods because these are public goods or, or uh, you know, the market has failed here right. and uh, there's an externality and something has to be done by the right. state. But at least when you're going to, if you're going to impose a tax, at least be aware of the cost. Right? Right. And, and it is true that there are perhaps taxes, uh, one, one could say that the... Uh, the extent to which a tax is neutral is not the same for every tax, yeah. right? So Rothbard himself points out that uh, this is one of the strikes against income taxes. Yeah. Income taxes tend to be le tend to, in practice, actually be less neutral because there's more revenue uh, taken by the state yeah. than, say, uh, uh, an excise tax or a tariff or yeah. something like this, right? And um, you know, it's it's uh, fascinating um, how our public policy uh, ethos seems to recognize the truth of what has it is saying. Whenever you um, have proposals from the left and the right for so-called tax holidays. Yes, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Suddenly. Isn't, isn't that strange? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Suddenly our eyes are open. <laughs> yeah. Let's have a tax holiday. Oh, that'll be great for business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Why don't we just make it you know, yeah, everywhere? Permanent, right? Yeah, permanent all over the, <laughs> the whole country. Yeah. Um, and reading through the chapter, is it your sense that um, the um, theoretical apparatus of economics that he's addressing here, the fallacies that he's addressing, uh, do they seem like they've changed that much over the 60 years? No, I don't think so. No, they haven't changed much. I think they're very similar. No, they haven't changed. Yeah. Basically, it's the same fallacy uh, over and over again. I get again. that impression from the whole book. Right, right. He seems to have picked out a whole series of issues that seem to be yeah, timeless, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately, timeless. <laughs> Universal fallacies held yeah, by right. all people at all times and all places. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for helping us unravel some of these today. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Yeah. This is uh, Jeffrey Tucker. I'm at the Mises Institute, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Tom Woods. We're talking about his book, Economics in One Lesson. Oh, wait a minute. That's not yours. That's one of the books you didn't write. <laughs> That's <laughs> a rare case. Yeah. Okay, so this was written long before you and I were born. Right. Uh, 1946. I wish I'd written it, though. What is it, sold two million copies? That'd <laughs> be it. That's serious world. Yeah, that's right. negotiated a contract. Yep. About it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so we're talking about just one chapter. And it occurs fairly early in the book, and it concerns government loans. So the idea is that if um, uh, the private markets will not uh, will not suffice to fund a particular program or project or service, so we have to get the government involved in it. And this was 1946. I mean, goodness. These government loan markets have vastly expanded in that time, haven't they? Sure, with the same rationale and everything to boot. That's right. Well, it's useful to bear in mind the theme of the whole book here for this chapter, which is his emphasis on what is seen versus what is not seen. That if you're going to think like an economist, you have to think of the consequences for everybody over the long term of whatever it is the government is doing. So he gives the example of a farmer who's applying for some loan so that he can buy a tractor or some such thing. And he contrasts the situations of farmers A and B. A has a track record for honesty and paying his debts and being credit worthy. And he's also got some assets that you know can be used as collateral. But then you've got B who has no assets. He's got no track record. He might even be on government relief. And so the argument is, well, why shouldn't B get a chance? You know, and the only chance he could possibly have is if the government uh. lends him the money, intervenes in the credit market to lend him the money. And Hazlitt's argument is to note that we should remember that what's really being lent here isn't so much the money as it is the tractor, and then he's going to pay back and, and, and uh, you know once he can. But there's a fixed number of tractors at any given time. So if I lend a tractor to one person, there's somebody else who can't get the tractor. And so what he suggests is that when you lend this additional money, this government uh, uh, provided credit to this one guy, you are depriving somebody else of this same property. You're depriving somebody 
who has worked to build up a reputation for honesty and a credit rating and so on. And so, so he keeps it in that, in that light. Like why is it morally preferable that this person should get this and crowd out this person out, out of the market? So that's the type of argument. And then he also reminds us that the private banking industry has every reason to be careful under normal conditions, by the way. Let's, let's abstract from the Fed, but to right. be careful in how it makes loans, because if it, if it makes a bad loan, well, then it's, it's in big trouble. So it, it has to become very skilled at determining who is a reliable and a, a good credit risk and who isn't. Because, as I say, if they make a mistake, they lose their own funds. Whereas a government bureaucrat typically has no experience here, has taken some civil service exam, you know, in which he's got to write about hypothetical people in hypothetical situations. And if one of these loans goes sour, well, you know, there are no consequences. Nobody's fired. If anything, it just goes to show uh, just how bad the situation is. We've got so many unfortunate people. Even this amount of government money hasn't helped them. We need even more. So, you know, you cannot get the government into this business because it winds up making bad loans that for good reason the private sector didn't want to make. And isn't it really something that in recent days with all this, with this housing calamity that's going on, that people are asking the question, well, what is it with the, with the banks? You know, they seem to have uh, lent money where they shouldn't have. These people weren't credit worthy. And yet, uh, the whole of government policy for the last, I don't know, umpteen uh, decades or whatever, has been designed to, to badger them. Into and, doing exactly and, this. Yeah, right. yeah, of course. Well, I mean, there's the, the one argument is uh, the Community Reinvestment Act, which requires banks to make loans against their better judgment to groups that are perceived as having been discriminated against. Right. But as the record shows, in fact, if just look at the statistics. If you look at various racial groups who are assumed to be discriminated against, there is no evidence for this, that in fact they have the same default rates as anybody else. If they were being held to some higher unreasonable standard, they wouldn't be defaulting as much. So, And then we also have the fact that Asian Americans get loans at a, at a considerably higher rate than whites. And, one assumes there's no particular reason for there to be a pervasive pro-Asian bias in the banking community. Right. So that, you know, that whole. But so, in other words, uh, the Community Reinvestment Act is based on a fallacy right off the bat involving discrimination. But it's it's intended to make loans to people who don't have very good credit ratings. And of course, the egalitarian mind hates the credit rating, which is the one yeah. great you know criterion of you know trustworthiness when it comes to to, to money. Right. So uh, banks have been required to make these loans, but it's not even just that. I mean, you've got, uh, I mean, Hazlitt in his book wants to hold off credit creation until later, but there's no reason we, right, we sure, have to sure, sure, be bound sure. by yeah. that. I mean, the Federal Reserve System, of course, pumps all this additional money and credit into the system. And as a result, banks, you know, banks pretty much at any one time have made the loans they can make. So if they find themselves now with all this new, you know, money on their hands, they've got to either lower the uh, requirements, lower the qualifications to get the loan, uh, or, and or lower the interest rate. And so what they wind up doing is, again, making, making loans that under normal conditions they wouldn't have made. And then beyond this, we have these weird uh, government-sponsored enterprises, they're called, yeah. uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Right. Uh, I mean, Fannie Mae was once a full-fledged government agency. And then these things were really, really only came into their own as major players in the mortgage market about 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. And they, because... They're privatized. Yeah, they're yeah. so-called privatized, yeah. even though they enjoy tax benefits no other right. um, comparable institution would enjoy. They have regulatory benefits. They also enjoy the status of having everyone basically know that if they get in trouble, they'll be bailed out. Socialized losses. Exactly. So the risk yeah. is socialized. And so therefore, that's another incentive for banks to make risky loans because they know that Fannie and Freddie will just buy up these mortgages from them and assume the risk. And so, it, and you know, as Lou Rockwell points out, if you're inclined to say, well, wait a minute, you know, the banks shouldn't be making these shaky loans in the first place, regardless of whether or not they can socialize the risk, Lou points out, well, look, the fact is, all your competitors are going to be doing this. All your competitors will be making these loans right. and making money, at least in the short run, on them. And you'll get eaten for breakfast if you don't play the game. So right. the government has so corrupted the system that even somebody who wants to be an oh, honest sure. banker can't do it. No. Yeah. And of course, it's the, in the government's interest always to distract attention from its own responsibility for things. So it's always, it's not our price controls that are causing the meat shortages, it's the farmers hoarding the meat. 
It's not us who are it's not we're not responsible for high oil prices. It's the price gougers at the pump. It's the oil companies, the evil oil companies. Or it's we're not responsible for the mortgage mess. It's these uh, irresponsible lenders. It's never the government. So it's incredible, isn't it? Over the years, what an absolutely pristine track record government has. It's never been responsible for anything. <laughs> it can only Amazing. do good stuff. Yeah. And all of its regulations will we should always just, fix the problem. We should just give right. all our money to the government. Right, right. In fact, you know, one of my favorite old shows was The Honeymooners. And, I, and a lot of times, Jackie Gleason would sort of improvise when he would uh -huh. do his lines. And there was one show where at the end, you know, at first he was criticizing the government about taxes. And at the end, he actually says, We've got the best government in the world. We should give all our money to the government. I said, oh, I'm not Jackie Gleason. No. Come on. So Hazlitt nailed it in 46, and I suppose that there wasn't this big national priority yet that every, every person should own a, a mansion, a, right. a, a plywood palace. Uh, but, uh, but it was soon to happen, a few years later, that uh, somebody decided that uh, the very definition of being an American is that you would own a home. Um, but and it took all these years for it to become this absurd bubble that's now exploded and is causing grave financial difficulties for us. So there might be other things um, out there. Now we've got the student loan problem, of course, that emerged uh, sometime between the time Hazlitt wrote the book and today. Yeah. And uh, maybe you can address that. Well, sure. I mean, the student. I mean, I'll just, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, you know, I took out some student loans, but I'm one of the suckers who actually paid them back. <laughs> You know, unlike the deadbeats who are running around all over the country going to Hawaii or something, not paying them back. But, you know, the fact is, though, that these, stu these student loans, first of all, the ready availability of all this free credit is itself at least largely responsible for inflating the price of a college education. Because yeah, yeah. if, if the institution knows you're bringing all this heavily subsidized loan money with you, well, the price is going to go up. I mean, if we funded... The purchase of potato chips in the same way it would cost you know a hundred thousand dollars for a bag of chips you know so it's, it shouldn't be a surprise and you know I, I like what a lot of uh, financial advisors are starting to say which is that young kids are putting themselves in an impossible hole at the very beginning of their lives you know they start off in debt a hundred and sixty grand or something yeah. that's how they start their lives and you know I mean I've heard it said uh, you know that if you were to take your money and put it in almost anything and just let it let it grow. It would it would have been better for you, even even when you count the human capital you're building. It would have been better than if you went to college with it. Yeah. So, uh, arguably, the best thing you should do is either, if you can possibly in in high school, get a year's worth of college in with your AP courses, cut that down somehow, uh, or yeah. finish college a year early, or spend five years there, but but work, uh, work, work part time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and, and then that way, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, if you can get out a year early, you know, then this is, you know, th there's an opportunity cost there that you no longer have to bear. You have an extra year salary. Yeah. I mean, you have to think of, you know, Gary North has a lot to say about this. But you have to think of unorthodox solutions to the the, the price of an education. But but the student loan situation is not helping young kids. It's absolutely right. burying them. Right. So it really is a calamity. I mean, you've got this argument that, well, the government has to give these loans because private enterprise will not. And yet, it seems as if pri if private enterprise will not, then they shouldn't be given at all. Yeah, that's right. That, that, that's an indication that society in some way is making clear through the market the type of risks it's willing and interested in taking. I mean, it, it's somewhat analogous to the fact that, suppose in 1974, uh, we had known how to make an iPod, let's say. But, of course, we just weren't at the level, like, the ability to produce the stuff was just still way, way beyond us. We could probably have produced an iPod in 1974, but when you think of all the resources that would have been required to extract from society toward this project, it, it would have been totally out of line with consumer desire. You know? right. So the market has a way of balancing the fact that, yes, we'd all like iPods in 1974, or we'd all like every single human being to have a, a four-year education, you know, you know, heavily subsidized. But the fact is, we can't have all these things. There's a trade off involved, and the market helps us to balance these things out rationally. You've written a lot about economics and morality. And your comment earlier about credit ratings uh, being an indication of, of uh, trustworthiness, and uh, I wonder if you could elaborate on, on that uh, the extent to which credit and credit ratings actually help shape our characters. 
Hmm, well, the way you put it, I'd love to hear you elaborate on this, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, no, it just no, occurred to me when you said that. I mean, this is one way that the markets help helps train us. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, if you follow your credit rating, if, if you subscribe to any kind of service, it'll actually tell you this is why your score is what it is. You've got these positive elements, but you've got these negative elements. You keep opening up new credit accounts. Yeah. You keep doing this or that, or, or you, know, you won't pay this bill. You know, you're being a bum or something. And it, it tells you this. And if you want people to interact with you on the best possible terms, then you know exactly what you need to do basically to improve your own character, not to take on uh, purchases that you can't possibly really meet the, the, the cost of. I mean, you, you do learn these things, and these are good qualities that you should have as a, as a human being. And, and also, we should, we should bear in mind, we're not saying that, you know, therefore, you know, very, very few people should have houses. There's no way to know, there's no non-arbitrary way to determine how many people should live in, their, in, in homes they own, how many should rent. You know, the market has to determine that. But I do think that maybe a lot of people should just have smaller homes. Yeah. You can still own your own home, but yeah. not everybody has to have a gigantic mansion. And I do kind of like... Um, Karen DeCoster's term that she invented that's now in the Urban Dictionary. It's the 2000 Air. It's the guy, he's got the brand new home, the two beautiful cars, he goes on great vacations with his wife, and they've got $2,000 in the bank. <laughs> and so I mean, one, even the slightest calamity, and they are wiped out. Yeah. And the credit rating is there, in effect, to f force you to the best it can to try to prevent this thing from happening, yeah. to, to plan your life more sensibly and responsibly. And it isn't interesting too that the more short term, you, the more irresponsible you are, the more short term you're thinking, the higher an in interest rate you're going to pay. So at least there's a little bit of a punishment. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. The market is, is good all around yeah. in this sense. <laughs> We've made a good case, Dr. Woods. Okay, Thank you. pleasure being with you, Jeff. Jeffrey Tucker, I'm at the Mises Institute, and today I'm interviewing Robert Murphy, who's an economist, um, and uh, we're going to be talking about one chapter from this new edition of Economics and One Lesson, a book that was published in 1946, republished now, um, and just as relevant as ever. And uh, Dr. Murphy, the subject uh, of the chapter we're discussing is, uh, has to do with jobs. Mm -hmm. And technology, right? Right. And the title of the chapter is the curse of machinery. The curse of machinery. Okay. So, what does Hazlitt mean by the curse of machinery? Well, he's referring to the fact, and he and he shows that it's gone back uh, far back in history. That any time a new technique is developed that is a, a labor-saving device, that people fear it because they think, oh, you're throwing people out of work, and so machinery is a curse because it's just causing unemployment, and so therefore we ought to resist the introduction of new machines, sometimes with the caveat, unless the machine doesn't save labor. So as long as it's not putting people out of work, then sometimes people say, okay, a new machine's a good thing. But if it causes the firm to lay off some people because now we have the machine doing the job of 10 men, then that's obviously bad. That's the, the, and the idea. And he talks about the Industrial Revolution and mm -hmm. how this is a controversy back. But even now, it's a controversy. Right. Even about the Industrial Revolution, you still read people say, well, you know, it was really regrettable. You know, it took people off this, the wonderful, uh, their happy lives on their, on their landed, uh, landed uh, plots there, mm -hmm. and they drove them to the city. R right. And he, so he goes through it. And he, I like what he does in the chapter. So first, he just quotes people to make sure you believe he's not setting up a straw man. Uh -huh. He just quotes people after people saying just what you've said. Yeah. And you know, people fall away from up to Eleanor Roosevelt saying, well, yeah, in the past it was okay, but now this is really <laughs> serious. Like during the Depression, this is serious. And yeah, people just, they have these false views about what happened in the past. And he goes through his statistics to show, well, actually, in a lot of these industries with the new machines, for example, in the automobile industry, obviously there were more people employed in there in 1960 than in 1920. Right. And so clearly the introduction of machinery didn't, but he goes through and, and just shows those examples, and then, but then sort of makes makes the point also that, look, in the terms of the industrial revolution, in a sense, 
the population would have all starved to death if they didn't have all this new machinery coming into place. And so in a real sense, it created jobs because there are people working right now. It's not that there's 99% unemployment and most of those people would be dead if it weren't for the right. Industrial Revolution. So he goes through and traces the effects. Um, and there, the effects are somewhat unpredictable, aren't they, from new machinery. It can right. cause an expansion of an industry, but it can also cause its complete uh, elimination and displacement, right, of an industry. Right, so do you have you have in mind that the the horse and buggies go out of business because right. of the car? Right. Yeah. He so Hazlitt he doesn't. I mean, that's certainly one effect. But he what he's really trying to focus in on is the even sillier fallacy of in an industry that benefits from the machinery, uh -huh. so that they still make the same product, but okay. now they use machines to do it. But you're but you're right. He he makes the point that sometimes advocates on our side of this issue go too far, and they just stress the long term net effects on, in general and how everyone must be richer per capita, which is obviously true. With machines, more stuff's getting produced, so obviously per person there's more stuff to be consumed, but it is possible that individual laborers, if you spent your whole life learning a trade and then a machine comes along that does your job, you might be worse off for a few years. Right. And so it's good that he, 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 he dots all the I's and crosses all the T's and, and makes sure he catches uh, it's all the It's quite steps. systematic, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, a lot of this we can understand from our own work lives. In fact, that probably everybody can understand it at some level because mm -hmm. um, we've all benefited enormously from in the last 15, 20 years, actually, uh, almost daily. Sure. There are new things that help us. Right. I mean, it's, it's gotten to the point now where the anti-capitalist criticism is, you know, oh, give me a break. You know, I, I want to just be able to go on vacation and not have my boss be able to get in touch with me. And I just could turn off all my yeah. pagers. And, <laughs> or I was a consumer. I have too many choices. And you go into McDonald's and there's 16 different value menus. And, and so, yeah, now it's almost like they, even the people who hate capitalism can't with a straight face say it's, it's it impoverished us. Now they have to say we're overwhelmed with all these choices yeah. and all these gadgets that don't really help us. Uh, and yet, um, I'm sure you've... I had this experience of talking to people and the subject of you know computers and software and it's always an interesting dinner, mm -hmm. dinner time conversation come up and there'll always be somebody that says something like well you know I really regret a lot of this in many ways because you know we've just become this nation in which um, unless you know how to use a computer um, there's nothing for you to do and right. there's lots of people who just cannot and will not do this and what's going to become of them right and yeah I mean what at some point there, there's always ways you can try to show, well, no, even anybody, even someone, like if you've you seen it in the fast food restaurants now, like some of the, the terminals, they just have pictures of the value uh -huh. meals. And so, I mean, they, they really just do everything business needs to do to cater to any type of, you know, human being of any sort. Like, how can we adapt to, to use this person to, to integrate them into the social nexus of cooperation? Uh -huh. but, but you're right. I mean, ultimately, if there is somebody that just refuses to learn, I mean, what if someone just said, I don't want to use language? What are you going to do about that? And right. is that a vexing social problem? Well, I don't know. But it's, you know, this is all voluntary decisions happening. And if the great majority are benefiting, we're not forcing you to not use computers. We're saying right. we're going to use computers, and if you're free to use them if you want to. Doesn't it seem like you meet more and more people, though, that um, are very successful at what they do, but are doing something that they weren't trained to do at all in college? Doesn't it seem more and more common now? I, th I think so. I mean, I don't, I don't know historically what the difference yeah. would be, but, but certainly, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not doing exactly right now what I thought I was going to be doing. Right. I thought I was going to be at a college, you know, teaching classes, and, right. and I'm not doing that right now, and I, but I love what I'm doing, and yeah, you're right. I'll, Plenty of people I talk to, it's, it's almost a joke. I don't even ask people anymore what's your major because I know it's just, that's more like just saying what are your hobbies <laughs> at this point. It, it has nothing to do. Isn't now I ask people, like, yeah. do you know what you're going to do with your career? Or what, it, even that's not the right phrase anymore because that right. just makes it sound like, oh, I'm going to go work for IBM for my life. And right. nobody thinks like that. Nobody anymore. thinks like that. But don't you have some sense, of course, we weren't around, mm -hmm. but don't you have some sense that sometime after World War II, there was this perception that, well, your life is really laid out right. for you. You know, mm -hmm. you go to school, you learn a particular trade, you land on that trade, and you work in that thing. You do the same thing until you retire and get the grandfather clock, and that's it. Sure, yeah. I, I grew up in Rochester, New York, yeah. and that I think its title was the imaging capital of the world because it had IBM and Xerox and Kodak were headquartered mm -hmm. there. And yeah, there people would be, when I growing, you know, in the 80s is when I started really becoming politically aware, and then the letters to the editor were because Kodak was downsizing, so was IBM. Yeah, right. And all the letters were talking about how it used to be that 
you know, there was loyalty. And you put in your hours in the company, you know, and you, they had your pension and everything, and now we're just outsourcing, and now it's all about the bottom line. And <laughs> so, yeah, certainly people say that it used to be this understanding that when yeah. you went to work for yeah. IBM or Kodak, that was it. And it, it wasn't been, understanding. And the pace of the technological changes mm -hmm. is, 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 seems to be uh, growing. I mean, it's accelerating, is what I mean to say. Um, and, and yet it's, it's, it makes life more interesting, doesn't it? I mean, can you imagine doing the same darn thing? I mean, we live in a world of relentless change. Oh, for sure. And, and I, th I mean, I love it. I, I do, too, and it, it's partly my personality. I have, uh, I, I don't mean uh, t to say this too glibly, but I think I have attention deficit yeah. disorder, and yeah, I yeah. can't... Well, we all do. <laughs> yeah, the, the, idea, the idea of just doing one thing for 30 years just seems inconceivable to me, so you're, so you're right, and it's uh, and this technological progress, it, it is accelerating, yeah. and, and we just take for granted that every, you know, we get a, every time we buy a new computer that's supposed to do things, then something little happens. Then I do this, too, and I get so mad. I say, do computers even save time? And I get all frustrated because <laughs> the Excel formula didn't get imported into Word properly. Yeah, when, right. when I was growing up, I mean, just to get a hard drive, was it like, oh, wow, there's a hard drive? This is amazing. And, you know, uh -huh. I upgrade to 640 RAM, kilobytes of RAM. This is amazing. And now, you know, I have more than that in my phone. And yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's what, really amazing. What about the next chapter that uh, is titled uh, Spread the Work. Spread the, what is a spread the work scheme? Is this an anachronism these days or no? No, I don't think it's an anachronism because most of the examples, so the spread the work scheme is just the idea that there's a fixed amount of work to be done and so it would be unfair, you know, left to their own devices, these greedy businessmen would have just picked the, the most efficient laborers, the ones that they could give the lowest wages to and they would do all the work and everyone else would be out of a job and so we need to have the government or unions come in and put rules in place to, to spread this fixed amount of work around to make sure everyone gets some pay and gets some work and that, you know, that would allow there to be more consumer spending and things like that. So that's the idea. And no, most of the examples Hazlitt gives are things like uh, federal rules on overtime pay. He said part of the motivation, the explicit motivation for that when they put those rules into place was we want to give businessmen an, an incentive not, you know, if they have 80 hours of work to be done, don't give it all to the most productive guy. Give you know forty hours to one person and forty hours to somebody else. So it wasn't about human rights. It was just a, a sort of a silly. Economic right. Policy. He yeah. Has let it clarify. He said some of those things were an issue like out, you know, prohibitions on child labor and things like that. He yeah. said he thinks a lot of the motivation was a sort of this is unseemly. But he said nobody thought working fifty hours a week was going to physically break someone's back, and that you know the the precise quantitative amounts for some of these things were clearly and explicitly ideas of during the depression and what have you know we got to really spread the work around involve as many people, people right. as possible in the production right and then and then he just goes through and quotes all these ridiculous union regulations things that i i know are still in force today maybe not the specifics but the idea that there needs to be the electrician on site to, to screw in a light bulb i mean really ridiculous things where yeah. they can't someone can't do the work of someone else yeah. or else you have to like pay him an extra day's wages and you have to pay the guy who should have right. done it and just all these crazy things. You to, encounter that in mm -hmm. large cities even now. I mean, just absurd. Right, yeah. I mean, I just, even when I was growing up, I, I worked at, at, in a factory at Kodak for a while, and I used to hear horror stories about guys. I mean, they, they weren't ideological. They were just joking around like, yeah, listen to this crazy story about just things like, it, you know, they had two more minutes left of work to do on this job, but, oh, it's lunchtime. we got to go to lunch. Yeah, and then right. the guy was saying, well, why don't we just finish this and be done with it? No, no. And then, you know, so then that whole section of the factory was shut down for another two hours because they had to go to lunch and come back just to do two right. minutes of work right. and you know if that were if there weren't these official regulations obviously so we live with these mm -hmm. with the remnants of this fallacy but is the fallacy itself itself still around do you hear it uh i guess it, i don't i don't think i hear it as much now as, as hazlitt seems to make it sound it being prevalent then i mean some of the other stuff in his book about um you know the benefits of a of a, of a tornado Get boosting GDP because now we have to rebuild. I mean, those sorts of things, the broken window fallacy, I see a lot more now. The spread the work idea, it's still embedded in, in union propaganda, but I haven't heard, I haven't seen that being trumpeted what, too much. I haven't much. asked you what's wrong with it. What's wrong with actually spreading the work? With the spread the work scheme? Yeah, yeah it, it's We're just assuming that this is stupid, Right, because we know it's, yeah, we know it's wrong, yeah, but yeah, it, it is, and that's, again, just to, to plug Hazlitt's book. Yeah. He, you know the stuff's got to be wrong, but he just goes through and says, let's, let's make sure we understand why it's wrong. And, right. and yeah, with this, he said, okay, so let's say the government um, or, the, or the union or whatever have you just sets up a rule where, okay, now there's a certain amount of people working, and why don't we say you have to work 
75 percent of the hours you used to and that and that's the rule and they said there's two ways you know two things that can happen so if, the, if we allow the business to cut wages and so that they're you know the workers who used to be employed working so so much now earn 75 percent in their paycheck he said well then you know you haven't all you've done is they're giving some of their money to the to the people who now fill the gap in and so it's not that society's richer and you're just you're benefiting one group at the expense of the other. You're not helping labor because obviously the workers who now get their hours cut back are worse off. Right. And then he said, on the other hand, if if you insist that no, no, you had let's cut back their hours, but you still have to give them the same gross paycheck every week, and then also then decide what you want to do if you want to hire more workers. Well, then clearly that's going to cause unemployment that you've in effect you know put in a, a wage control, and and that you're forcing the employer to pay more per hour than he originally wanted to. And so that's going to cause them to, to hire fewer workers. And obviously, and so in an attempt to help workers, you're just throwing people out of work. It would be no different from just saying, why don't you just increase pay by 25%? And we and we can think through why that wouldn't help workers in yeah. general. Yeah. So it's, it's again, it just you just say in, in the original equilibrium before this intervention, things were the way they were for a certain reason. And, and even there, he has clarified that this is under the most generous assumptions that really what happens is the people who are working the most are the most productive. And so if you arbitrarily say you can't work as much and give that job to somebody else, then the total amount of output drops because now right. you're giving the work to people who aren't as efficient. Right. It's, it's an example of government regulations creating people as some sort of uh, acting as if all workers are homogeneous. Right, you know? right. Uh, in, 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 in this, and then in the previous chapter too, the curse of machinery, he stresses over and over that one of the main things that's wrong with this is this idea that there's a set amount of work that needs to be done, and right. who's going to do it. When no, in general, if wages can adjust, you can hire as many people as want to work. And so then the issue is not there's a, these are the tasks to be done, who's going to do it, but no, different tasks can be done. I mean, labor's scarce, and you put workers into where they're most highly needed. And then if more machinery comes in, oh, great, now we can do more stuff. Right. We can accomplish more things. And so you always channel workers to where they're needed most on the margin. And this observation that there's always work to do isn't just uh, an empirical observation of a certain time or a place, but it's always true, always and everywhere, isn't it? Right, yeah. I mean, we, you could, I suppose, come up with crazy scenarios if there were 10 trillion people and someone would be, you know, uh, it would, labor would no longer be scarce. But, yeah, it's, this is clearly, <laughs> yeah. uh, in any practical sense, there's yeah. always more work to be done. It's The reason people stop working is because on the margin they say, you know what, my leisure is more important. It's yeah. not because there's absolutely nothing that right. human creativity right. and a pair of hands couldn't contribute to create more output that consumers yeah. would want. Yeah. That, that that never happens. Because we don't live in a utopia. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Murphy, for your wonderful talk. Oh, thanks for having me. This is Jeffrey Tucker with another installment in our continuing series of interviews with economists about this book, Economics in One Lesson. And uh, it's my privilege to introduce Walter Block, who is the editor of the book. Actually, not editor. You just wrote the introduction. But certainly one of the top enthusiasts for Hazlitt's work. Oh, yes. And, <laughs> <laughs> so the first chapter we're going to cover is disbanding troops and bureaucrats, a particular problem in 1946, right? And the second one concerns this issue of full employment, which is a phrase we still hear today. So let's first talk about uh, troops and bureaucrats. Maybe you can give some some of uh, the background behind Hazlitt's discussion. Well, in 1946, I think the book came out in 46, so I right. might have written it in 45, mm -hmm. uh, I'm guessing, but yep. maybe 44, late 44. Uh, say it was 45, and he knew the war was just about over, or it was over, and now... There were many, many foreign uh, sol soldiers located in Europe, located in Asia, many, many of them in World War II. And they wanted more than anything else to come home, I'm sure, uh, to establish families or to see their wives and kids who they hadn't seen for a while. And they were going to sort of inundate the U.S. with themselves. So there'd be many of them coming. And 
people were afraid. Would there be jobs enough for them? And I think that was the context under which um, uh, Hazlitt was writing. And the fear would be that there wouldn't be jobs for them because, you know, right now uh, we have 1% unemployment or whatever it was, or 2% unemployment, and now you have several hundreds of thousands or even millions of people descending upon the U.S. all within a matter of weeks or months at the most, and maybe there wouldn't be enough jobs for them. But Hazlitt quite rightly uh, set this aside or gave it the back of his hand as it deserves. Uh, the idea we have to address is what creates jobs in the first place? We have to get down into the nitty-gritty. And the reason we have jobs in the first place is because of scarcity. And what is scarcity? Scarcity means we have less than what we want. We have this much, we want that much. And that's where the jobs come from. And as long as there's unmet needs, as long as people want more stuff than they have, there'd be jobs not only for all the U.S. soldiers, but for um, a zillion Martians, yeah. or Chinese, or just anyone. Yeah. Um, uh, could come down to the U.S. And, or to the world or whatever and, and have jobs. Perhaps, perhaps it would be easier to understand uh, if people understood that uh, that Hazlitt is writing and also not not just in light of the Second World War, but also from the New Deal experience, where we had these all these years where the government was trying to reduce the unemployment rate but couldn't, and the widespread perception that it was the war that solved the employment problem. Right? Right. <laughs> well, Higgs has done a lot of good work on that. I mean, that, that was just silly. Uh, we certainly uh, had uh, unemployment problems. I mean, if you take uh, millions of people and take them out of the labor force, of course the unemployment rates are going to look better. Uh, but I, I think the point uh, needs to be made that I, I think we've said this before about Hazlitt is that it could have been written yesterday. Yeah. Because right now we have soldiers in Iraq and, I and Iran, and we have 800 military bases in 140 different countries. Right. And suppose, suppose Ron Paul ran one for president, and his first policy would bring, bring the troops home. I don't know that there are as many troops nowadays in 2008 as there were in 45, 46, but there's quite a hunk of them. Right. In uh, Germany and Korea, you know, you name a country, there's probably a U.S. troop there. And if we were to bring them all now, it's the same situation as it was in '46. But uh, part of the fear, though, is that these the people will have to be—I uh, don't know if the word is retrained—but they would t accept different kinds of jobs. Government jobs require different kinds of skills, especially in the military, than is required in the private sector. So that's part of the fear. Well, you see, I think the main fear was not so much that they would have to switch from killing people to making cars or, or something like that. Yeah. The fear was that there just weren't any jobs. Even if they were to switch. Now, you're quite right that the switching would take some time. People have to get allotted to the new slots. I, I can see that. But the fear that he was uh, addressing in this chapter was that there wouldn't be enough jobs, even if they were retrained, because, yeah. you know, there are millions of them coming. Yeah. Well, one way to look at it is that they come not only with arms, but with mouths. Yeah. Okay. And, and they'll be producing stuff that they'll be eating, yeah. or the additional amount that they produce they'll be eating. But see, to look at that way is sort of a Keynesian-ish way to look at it, that what's really causing it is their mouths, the man. Uh -huh. That's <laughs> it's, it's sort of backwards. First we have to produce, then we can eat. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's sort of a, a basic premise that you can't eat first. Eating can't be the, the cause of things. It's rather the um, uh, producing. And as long as we want more things than we have, there's jobs for them to do to create those things that we don't have. Now, there is one way out of that, and that is if we end scarcity. Lots of rock, as they say, but there are ways. I mean, one way to end scarcity is produce more, but it's very problematic because our eyes are bigger than our stomachs. No matter how much we produce, there's always something else we want. On the other hand, we could go the other route, the ascetic route, like Gandhi, where all you want is a diaper and some goat's milk, and that's it, although he did want the British out of India, which is, you know, not nothing. Uh, but apart from that, so if you had a, a group of ascetics who didn't really want much of anything, uh -huh. well, then there wouldn't be jobs for them, but then there'd be no need for those jobs because we don't want the stuff. Yeah. So there's really no problem with the laissez-faire capitalism. You know, it, it occurs to me, too, that this is also does have an impact on the immigration question, doesn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the fear that uh, there, that the immigrant, immigrants will uh, come in and there won't be anywhere for them to work, or another related fear is that there, 
will drive down wage rates for everybody else. Well, this is a very complex subject, and as you know, there is division among libertarians. Uh, Hans Hoppe and Murray Rothbard take one view on immigration. Not so much on the economic issues. Oh, no, no, right. no, no, not so on the economics. You know, right. yeah, uh, you're yeah. quite right. I yeah. stand corrected on yeah. that. Not on the economics. We right. all agree that there's no problem of creating jobs for immigrants, for soldiers, for Martians, for new babies. Right. Who are it's immigrating? Uh, who are immigrating from Storkovia? Yeah, they, they come with storks. I don't know if you knew this, Jeff, uh, but the, they come from this country called Storkovia, and storks bring them. That's first I've heard. Of and that, yeah. 20 years <laughs> later, uh, you've heard about this. <laughs> and 20 years later, or 15 years later, they need jobs too. And where do all these jobs come from? And the answer is, they come from scarcity. Yeah. As long as we want more than we have, there'll be jobs for immigrants. There'll be jobs for anyone. What about the fear of wage rates declining? Uh, well, there it's a very. This is not. We're now out of praxeology. We're into primology, right. and there will be, look if if uh, say uh, the immigration consists solely of physicists. Well, there might be a case where physicists' wages would fall, yeah. uh, and if the wage consists of solely low-skilled people, well, then the wages of low-skilled people might fall. But even there, it's it's an empirical issue. It might be that economies of scale, even with physicists or low-wage people, might increase it. It depends upon how much capital there is. These are very, very empirically uh, yeah. dirty questions. In any case, everybody is aware that uh, the rarer your skills are, the higher your pay tends to be, provided that your skills are more demanded in the market. So if, this, if uh, people who do your thing are more prevalent, then you need to move on. And we do that in life anyway, don't we? That's right. Look, what are we going to do? I mean, your daughter is now taking piano lessons. Yeah. So she's ruining the piano the industry yeah, yeah, because right. she's lowering the wages of all pianists slightly. Right. And by the way, so what are we going to do? Know, Forbid you. We, uh, <laughs> right. And why do we consider this to be such a terrible thing for a person to change? You know, well, the, uh, how many of us, well, I guess all of us have a variety of things we're interested in doing. Right. And, if, and if we find somebody who does what we're doing now, just as well as us, and does it at the same wage rate, and does it even better, then it gives us an opportunity to move Absolutely. on and do something else. Why is that such a terrible no, thing? No, no, I agree with you. Yeah. Hans Hoppe and I have an article co-authored where we say you have the right to own things, yeah. but you don't have the right to own the price of them. Yeah, yeah. Because the price of them is determined by all buyers and sellers of the marginal buyer and the marginal seller. Right. So if you get an extra physicist or a pianist, and the wages of physicists and pianists go down, tough. You shouldn't enter the market if you're af if you're afraid of things right. because you don't own the price. The price is determined right. by and the market. And tough and also uh, wonderful because it gives you a chance to do something else to so seek out seek out your highest value. Well, you don't necessarily have to do something else. You could stay as a pianist or a physicist just, just at a lower, lower wages, or if you don't like the wage, you, you go do something else. Yeah. So it's one it's really not a, it's not a problem. No. Um, and so a lot of the issues that ha has us dealing with here are refuting fallacies that are generated from a mechanistic view of economics that doesn't look at economics from the point of view of human actors, but looks at these big aggregates working. And so one of these aggregates is the unemployment rate. And so there's this longing for so-called full employment. And um, that doesn't really mean, in the, in the economics literature, that means it doesn't mean that everybody's working, does it? Well, certainly not. I mean, um, what is full employment? Well, in this chapter, what I think Hazlitt is doing, the essence of this chapter is saying, look, we don't want full employment. What we want is full production. Yeah. We want as much as production as we can get. Because look, I think he has this. I forget where, where he has this uh, story in which chapter, but I think it's in this chapter where he says, look, if you really wanted full employment, get rid of all the trains. <laughs> and and yeah, then put the the uh, the stuff that goes on a train, say from Auburn to um, or say from Atlanta to Chicago, a big long train of 500 cars. Each car has got tons of stuff in it. Put that on people's backs, 50 pounds to a person, and let them walk from Atlanta to Chicago. And then we'll have jobs not only for everyone in the United States. We'll have jobs for everyone that's ever lived, and and for trillions of people, because. You know, and that way you'd have full employment. But everyone would be working on carrying stuff from Atlanta to Chicago. We'd have no food, we'd have no clothing, we'd have no medical care, we'd have nothing. So I think he's focusing us in the right direction. Yeah. That full employment, employment is bad. We don't want employment. We're against employment. Employment is a bad thing. Play is good. 
employment is a bad thing. We, it's a necessary evil because we live in a world of scarcity, so we have to work in order to produce. But if I could press a button and say, look, no employment. You just want to play forever. And we, we just play, and, and stuff comes down from heaven like manna. You know, want a bicycle? You just sort of think a bicycle, you got one, you want lunch, you think about lunch, and you have it. We don't want employment. Yeah. We accept unemployment unhappily because we're on the wrong side of the Garden of Eden. If we're in the Garden of Eden, there'd be no unemployment, there'd be play. Now, Mises makes the, the very good point that some, the ideal thing is to be paid to play like a, a basketball player or a, a singer who I assume enjoys it and they get paid. Or you and I have a job. Jeff, don't tell Lou, otherwise he won't pay us. But we're not working, <laughs> if I can include you in here. I we are not. We've never worked an inch of our lives here yeah. at the Mises Institute. Yeah. We are playing. We enjoy yeah, this. Sure. If we could afford to, we would do it for no pay. Right. We're having fun now. Right. We're playing. It's true we're being paid to play, which is the ideal, yeah. but not everyone can be paid to play because you got to take out the garbage and not everyone likes dealing with garbage. Right. So we don't want employment we don't, and we don't want full employment. We don't want unemployment, namely people who want a job and can't get it, but that's due to government. Right. That's very what about thing. this idea that, um, that all unemployment in a free market is voluntary? Absolutely. All unemployment, that. Yeah. all unemployment in a free market situation is voluntary in the sense that you're demanding a higher wage than someone is willing to give you. Look, uh, Lou invited me to speak. Suppose I said, sure, Lou, I'll come for $5 million. Yeah. And Lou would say, well, you know, I'd love to have you, but $5 million is a little rich for our budget. I'd be unemployed. And uh, my school it doesn't pay me $5 million a year, and if I demanded $5 million, I'd be unemployed. Yeah. That's the choice you would make. Yes. On the other hand, if I was willing to work for five bucks an hour, I'm sure I could get a lot of jobs washing cars or whatever. Yeah. The lower the salary I'm willing to take, the more likely I am to get employment. Right. And this is one of the uh, additional problems with, with minimum wage, is it puts a, f a floor on, on people's ability to evaluate their uh, contribution. Yeah. So that they can make to you plan. know, the analogy that I like to use sometimes with the minimum wage is that the skunk is a very weak animal but it has a compensating differential, the smell, and if it didn't have that, it'd probably go extinct. Yeah. The uh, porcupine is a very weak animal, except for its quills, mm -hmm. and if it didn't have that, it'd go extinct. The deer, too, except for its speed. These are very weak animals, but they have one little thing that keeps them alive. Well, very unskilled people, too, have a compensating differential, the ability to work for low wages, yeah. and then they can get a job. Sure. But the minimum wage is like taking away from uh, a poor person, the quills of the porcupine or the smell of the skunk or the speed of the deer. It's vicious. It's depraved. It's immoral. It's disgusting. The people who do that ought to be subject to the full extent of the law. But here we are entering into another period where the unemployment data is on the rise a little bit, right? We're seeing more evidence of this. And the policy tendency is to do exactly what you're suggesting is the worst thing we today. just had a rise in the minimum wage, yeah. and we have another one scheduled, I think, up to 720 or something, yeah. something like that. And there'll that. be other moves to try to pressure employers from, from uh, firing workers, from laying people off, and so on and so on. Welcome back to the Depression. That's what FDR tried to do, keep wages up artificially, when it, it, and that's what caused the unemployment. If the wages would have been allowed to settle to their market levels, we... Yeah. We still had a depression, and, and there were misallocations of resources in the 20s. There would have been a lot of problems. But the depression could have lasted uh, 10 months instead of uh, 15 years, right. or 18 years, right. or however you count it. Well, and um, maybe we can say that you know, Hazlitt hadn't written his book yet in the Great Depression, so uh, maybe that's... Uh, uh, one factor, but he has written the book now, and so we have access to all this information. Uh, there's no excuse for repeating the same mistakes. Well, Hazlitt hadn't written his book by 29, but Mises had written a book or two, <laughs> so there was really no excuse. Uh, but the mainstream economists don't read Mises, so uh, yeah. that's the explanation, yeah. I think. Well, do you think it would um, assist in, pre in uh, avoiding some of these terrible errors of the past for this book to be oh, more widely circulated? It, you know, I, I, I used to be an anarchist, but I now believe in government, and government should have one function. Yeah. Um, they don't call me Walter Moderate Block for nothing. 
and the one function of the government should be to make everyone read that book. <laughs> And that's it. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm very moderate. I believe in government, but, you know, limited government. I'm not a, an extremist here. I'm a moderate. And they, they ought to make everyone read that bloody book yeah. and have a quiz on it. And if they don't pass the quiz, they read it again. Would your law expire or be applied to every new generation? Everyone. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Block. My pleasure. Jeffrey Tucker of the Mises Institute. I have with me Mark Thornton, also of the Mises Institute, and we're plowing through economics in one lesson to see what kind of lessons he offers and how they apply today. And today we're going to talk about trade. And in the headlines this morning is the, the news presented as a tremendous calamity to the world that uh, the latest trade negotiations have broken down and everyone's in a panic. So maybe you could put this in some context. Big surprise, right? <laughs> <laughs> you mean politicians getting together can't get along? <laughs> yes, exactly. Or that these trade talks uh, would break down. I mean, all of these uh, international agreements and trade talks have have always broken down at certain points, and there's, they, they take forever to uh, get to their supposed goals. Uh, and so, you know, a trade talk round um, can take years and years and years, and uh, they periodically break down. Uh, when the various interest groups um, are at loggerheads with one another. Yeah. It's not the politicians so much, but the interest groups that they're representing that, yeah. that break down. Yeah. So, for example, uh, in the third world or the developing world, you have a very strong desire for exporting their products, and a lot of these products are being protected by tariffs in the developed world. So it's a matter of uh, negotiating between those concerns. Absolutely. The, um, so it is really the interest groups behind them. It's the, um, the interests of the exporters uh, versus the domestic producers. It's the whole story that, um, that Hazlitt tells and tells so well um, about what's really going on. It's, uh, you know, the, the protectionism is supposed to protect, a, uh, protect particular jobs, and that's obvious in that scene. Uh, but what is not seen behind the scenes, so to speak, is that so many people are being hurt. Uh, the consumers being hurt, domestic uh, industries are being hurt, uh, and the, the whole protectionist scheme is a net loser for the economy. Now you say domestic industries. Um, you mean final producers of goods, right? Because there's many intermediate producers uh, that, well, the final producers are the ones that are benefiting from these from these uh, restrictions on imports, but there are many in between producers, wholesale manufacturers, and things that are very much hurt by the tariffs on uh, the goods that they use. I'm thinking, for example, of uh, sugar, mm -hmm. which is am, am I right? It's still heavily protected. It is very heavily protected. Yeah. Um, the U.S. sugar producers have and protected since the very beginning of yeah. the country. <laughs> I think that was to bring Louisiana into the Union or something. Um, and, and so they've always had protection. Um, it's really economically irrational for much of the U.S. sugar production to take place. It, it has very destructive effects on the Florida ec ecology, um, and it makes sugar prices for all Americans so much more expensive. How much more? Do you uh, several know? several times. Really, we would yeah. pay a third as much for sugar. Uh, we pay, let's say, three times uh, the world price of sugar. Right. So and we so pay that much less. We, if we had, if we could get rid of those restrictions and import sugar from Cuba, for example, uh -huh. um, the the price of sugar for Americans would go down, and many Americans say, "Well, I don't really buy that much sugar," but in reality, uh, you do. You yeah. buy sugar in, in so many products right. that you consume, all of the bakery goods and all of the candies and ice cream and uh, soda pop and, you know, right on down right. the list. 
Now, of course, the price is so high that uh, they've come up with the high fructose corn syrup, corn syrup as, right. a, as a... And that's been around for some years. Yes, uh, since I think after World War II, yeah. they, they started working on that um, as a way of helping the corn producers, <laughs> yeah. who, who seem to always need help as well. Yeah. Um, and so uh, most of our products have been altered uh, with taking the sugar out and putting the uh, high fructose corn syrup in them. Right. And so Coca-Cola in the United States doesn't taste like real Coca-Cola as it's produced well, elsewhere I, around the world. You know, I have to go and buy this Mexican Coke, to, uh, you know, which in the import section of the grocery stores to get anything that tastes decent. And, you know, I read a story the other day, I don't know if you bumped into this either, uh, also, but that said that um, this, uh, this corn syrup is actually much more fattening than sugar. Did you see that? So, it's, and, this, and this story actually speculated that this, this has substantial uh, impact. On, on you know the average weight of the average person in the American population. Yeah, so it has. It's supposed to have an impact on obesity yeah. and insulin problems. Yeah, there you go. And uh, now that is still being debated scientifically amongst that community. And uh, of course, the corn producers are saying no, it doesn't have any effect. It's the same thing. Yeah. And, and other people are saying no, it's correlated with obesity, and it's correlated with diabetes and um, all of those sorts of things. So scientifically. Uh, we haven't heard the final word on that. Um, I think there's a lot to the story, though, and uh, certainly the basic correlation is there. The more uh, corn syrup we've been consuming, the heavier we've gotten as a nation in general. And I think the science of it is that the high fructose corn syrup doesn't satisfy you yeah. as quickly as sugar and that the corn syrup is supposed to be more stored in your body rather than used yeah, right, directly right, like that. Right, I and and so that's the the theory behind this problem but, but it's the tariffs are ultimately behind this I yes. mean that's what's remarkable about it the unintended consequences yeah. you know economists can't necessarily spell all of these unintended consequences out um, at the very beginning but it should be we should all be aware that uh, we can't imagine all these problems we right. don't know everything that's going to happen behind the scenes but it's something to consider any time something like a tariff or a regulation is brought up is, wait a second, you've got these direct effects that's going to hurt consumers, that's going to make it more difficult you know, for unprotected industries to get land, labor, and capital, um, and then you're going to have all these diversions and unintended consequences, so watch out. Right. You know, and that's what Hazlitt is telling us. Look at the unseen problems that have emerged. Um, in things like sugar and the softwood uh, lumber right. tariffs right. and the, the steel tariffs of uh, 2002, um, That's right. these all have uh, you know wide-ranging uh, effects on the economy, and they're all negative. Okay, now explain this. Um, every president that I can remember in my lifetime has said that free trade is a wonderful thing. I'm talking about U.S. president, right? Free trade is a wonderful thing. We have to back this wonderful trade agreement. You know, we must just get behind it. Mm -hmm. And uh, anybody who says otherwise is just uh, 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 just backwards and uninformed. So there seems to be a big gap between the practice and what the politicians are preaching. Oh, absolutely. I mean, no uh, U.S. president that I could think of was actually for free trade. Yeah. <laughs> that they would actually say unilaterally. Right. Disarm um, our weapons of you know economic protectionism, uh, which is what free trade is. That's what Richard Cobden um, advocated. That's what Frederick Bastiat advocated. That's what Henry Hazlitt advocated: is unilateral economic disarmament, uh, not negotiated international agreements. Um, there's severe problems with international negotiated agreements. There's no problems with free trade. You just unilaterally lower your barriers, lower your restrictions, and trade emerges on its own. International agreements break down, and when they do, they can uh, lead to things like war. Okay, so Europe went through this in the 19th century where through bilateral agreements and then multilateral agreements, they all reduced their tariffs um, in the 19th century, but that led to um, internal contradictions within that system 
that ultimately broke out in hostility and was one of the ingredients leading up to World War I. Very so, uh, you know, the idea that we can negotiate our way to free trade is ridiculous. I mean, we can get some freer trade through those things, but the, the, the long-run consequences are very dangerous. Right. Then you have these boards that are set up to arbitrate disputes and, and, uh, and uh, now why wouldn't those lead to more peaceful uh, so you don't have to turn to war. You have to turn to these arbitration panels, no? Well, I mean, that's where the conflict arises, uh -huh. is, it, is it with the, these panels and these organizations. Yeah. That's where the infighting comes to impasses um, and, you know, and things break down, just as this yeah. trade barrier, this trade talks have, have broken down. Uh, hopefully this breakdown will not result in any kind of war, but you can imagine um, economic circumstances 10, 15 years from now where uh, trading negotiations between the United States and China and, and other parts of the world, the Middle East, you know, that could come to great impasses that result in actual armed conflict as well. So when you talk about free trade, you're really not talking about the World Trade Organization? No, or an absolutely not. No. There, there are aspects of free, freer trade within these organizations, such as the right of developing countries to import textiles and garments and clothing into the United States without any Right. Barriers. So there, there are some, uh, there is some freer trade, you know, and of course, those the lowering of those barriers helped American consumers. They had a very negative effect here in Alabama. Uh, we we lost all of our textile mills here in the state of Alabama. But look what happened. We lost our steel mills and our textile mills, and what were they replaced with? They were replaced with automobiles, uh -huh. finance, high tech, uh, healthcare. And so when I ask some of my fellow citizens here in Alabama, would you rather that the population be working in, in textile mills or automobile plants? Would you rather have them working in iron mills or in finance and things of that nature or health care? And of course, they always say, well, you know, of course we'd rather have these higher paying, uh, more sophisticated uh, jobs for our population. Uh, so they can see the benefits after the fact. but. Up front, they were everybody was totally against yeah, all, right. all this um, re relaxation of, of protectionism. You know, another thing about these negotiations, um, it's it's very interesting because what is the U.S. position on on these uh, within these negotiations? Usually, it has something to do with if we're going to lower our tariffs, then you've got to accept uh, what uh, our policies that we're going to impose on you, such as IP, intellectual property. Uh, recognition, you know, so that uh, American music manufacturers or something can can crack down on you know, pirated DVDs or whatever. Uh, another one of these labor regulations and environmental restrictions that the U.S. is advocating that these other countries pick up, they can can hardly afford them, right? Right, they they absolutely can't afford them. They can't, you know, stop the IP problem, um, and so you know those are those are going to be part of the impasse. Yeah that uh, it has been developing, is developing, um, and probably can only get worse, really. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, there's nothing to suggest that, uh, that these countries can comply with um, our labor regulations or yeah. our minimum wage law or anything like right. that. Although so. American labor unions would love that, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and why? Because they believe in the rights of workers all over the world? Uh, I'm afraid <laughs> not, <laughs> Mr. Tucker. Um, and that's why the unions are supposed to be, be you know, um, supposedly financing some of these uh, anti-globalism groups uh -huh. around, you know, that protest yeah. uh, uh, globalism because they want uh, the left, sort of left-wing agenda of labor regulations and so forth to be um, more prominent and, and be a d definitive part of the, of, the, of the global project. So to speak. Raise, raise the cost of the competition. Right. That's, that's the game, right? That is Regular the game. game. Yeah. Right. Or take a cut. In the case of intellectual property, take a cut, yeah, take a cut. of the revenue of foreign producers right. yeah. who are otherwise able to sell, uh, produce and sell their products at a much lower price. <laughs> well, this is an, a huge racket. Um, now, this topic is frustrating for you as an economist, isn't it? Because it's been explained now for centuries, and yet we still somehow don't get it, right? Oh, yeah. If you, if, well, if you read um, Hazlitt's chapter on, you know, who gets protected, 
um, he starts off with a very frustrating um, discussion about, you know, we've known all this. We, do, we don't need to be talking about the finer points of economic theory. We know the basics about tariffs and protectionism uh, since at least the time of Adam Smith, and uh, that this is the biggest step forward that we could take. We could just decide to become free trade, and it would be the biggest benefit to the economy that we could possibly do. And so there's a tremendous amount of frustration on the part of Hazlitt and myself and, and all the other um, Austrian economists about, you know, the, the just the common sense of free trade. Yeah. So um, what do you suppose is the missing ingredient? What do we, what's missing? Why can't we get from here to there, from our current protectionist environment to a world of free trade? Well, of course, the special interest groups that yeah. benefit from these individual free trades have advocates uh, who are paid large amounts of money to lobby Congress and other groups. Um, and what we need uh, to oppose that is the wide-ranging recognition of the benefits of free trade and that people understand what free trade is, unilateral, and what it is not, which is these groups and these organizations and these agreements. And, uh, and to proceed along those lines, which is far more efficient, which is far faster, uh, and it's less likely to result in any kind of conflict between nations. Uh, and then eventually, once you go through a very short period of adjustment, like we did here in, in Alabama through the late 1980s and early 1990s, and all of a sudden, you know, we're at a much better economic position. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people are happy with the outcome that they feared to begin with. Wouldn't it set a wonderful example for the world, too? Absolutely, absolutely. Right. There's no, there's no question. I mean, you think about Cuba and Florida, yeah. where Florida is destroying uh, the Everglades and its its ecology in order to produce sugar, uh, and Cuba, is, people are you know on starving and they have no access to any kind of economy at all. And if we could just open up the free trade there, open up the door between Cuba and Florida, it would solve Florida's problem. It's, it's, it's ecological problem, it's water problem, and so on and so forth. Uh, Cuba would be a much more prosperous country, and all that takes is the will to do it. And um, we would consume less corn syrup and more sugar, and we'd all be thin. <laughs> <laughs> right? Or something like that. <laughs> well, it just, it, it, all the benefits start rolling yeah. out, all the un, unintended consequences yeah. start being rolled back. It's, it's a wonderful process, and I hope we start it real soon. Well, thanks so much for explaining this to us, Dr. Thornton. You're welcome. This is Jeffrey Tucker. Again, I'm here with yet another economist to talk about our new edition of Economics in One Lesson. We're covering two more chapters. Uh, the economist in question is Peter Klein. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, Jeff. It's great to be here. <laughs> and uh, the two chapters we're talking about, well, the first one begins with the title, Parity Prices. Right. Parity Prices. I haven't heard this term in, in uh, modern journalism anymore. What's, what's up with this? Right. This is a term that uh, I guess it's a little bit archaic. Uh, you still see it in the technical economics literature what they call purchasing power parity. Oh, yeah. Parity just meaning equality or yeah. sameness. So the concern that Hazlitt was dealing with in the 1940s is the worry that, uh, that certain groups, uh, farmers, for example, would lose purchasing power if the prices of the goods and services that they produce, commodities, for example, did not maintain their parity from year to year. So sort of a general, uh, the, the concern Hazlitt's dealing with is the fear that prices will fall and that therefore sellers of those commodities will be harmed, and that they'll have that will have negative effects on other sectors of the economy, and so on. So it's basically a plea to keep prices up. I, I see. So, uh, well, it turns out to not be that much of a consideration anymore, partly because of inflation, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we don't worry too much about falling prices. Right. Where we do see prices falling in industries like 
telecommunications, computers. Of course, we think it's a great thing. I mean, think of what a personal computer cost in 1980 or 1985 compared to what you got, 2000 2500 bucks, $3,000 for something that, you know, doesn't have the computing power of the cheapest cell phone today. Uh, and you can get a PC for $500 today. That's, of course, vastly greater than anything you could have gotten uh, in 1980. Hazlitt actually uses a numerical example like that with um, automobiles and shows how is, uh, the, the sort of the real cost of uh, producing automobiles has fallen and how we would think it was a horrible thing if we had to pay in today's dollars the equivalent of what we you know, paid for a Model T Ford and, and to get that kind of quality because we simply wouldn't pay for that quality today. So in general, you know, prices falling is a good thing. It means, it means just increase in productivity. So that I understand the argument. Um, the argument concerning purchasing power is slightly different from the point that um, it's, it's, it's bad for the industry for prices to fall. Because it is difficult to do business in, under falling price conditions, That's right. right? So uh, talk first about this purchasing power point. What does it mean? Right. Right. What he has in mind is the idea that a particular group in society, let's say that uh, I uh, am in the plumbing business, okay. and let's say that for some reason the demand for plumbing services falls and the market price of, of plumbing services goes down. I, as a plumber, have a hard time making ends meet. Okay. Uh, in general, you know, you might say, well, that's, that's, that's a sad thing, Peter. We're sorry for you. Maybe you should consider another line of work. Right. But I, as a plumber, and my plumber friends might go to... I go to the state, I go to the American people, and I say, you know, pity the plight of the poor plumbers. Wow, that takes a lot of alliteration. And, uh, you know, if, if we don't have plumbers, then, you know, society can't, can't get by without plumbing, and we're a vital part of the American system, and so on. Your spending so, habits, or just uh, well, a critical but, link in, our, the, our, in the, yeah. our existence, yeah. and also our spending. In other words, if the plumbers... Uh, go out of business, then they won't be spending money on the goods and services that plumbers buy, uh -huh. and there'll be some sort of ripple effect throughout the whole economy. So essentially, it ends up being a kind of protectionist argument. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that even though this term, uh, you know, uh, where we see the term parity as in purchasing, purchasing power parity, where that appears today, it's more in the international trade and macroeconomics literature. I mean, this is in a series of chapters in which Hazlitt is talking about different kinds of protectionism, yes. special interest group politics. And he has, in particular, groups like uh, agricultural producers in mind, that the call for agricultural producers to use government policy to keep prices from falling is just another form of special privilege for one particular group, yeah. a politically well, I, connected you know, group. I must say that when you're presenting the argument, it's not inherently implausible. Right? Sure. Yeah. Sure. I mean, it, it's it's absolutely true that uh, uh, you know uh, when 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 uh, when plumbers or farmers, let's say, are economically successful and doing well, right. they have money to spend on other goods and services, and there are certainly you know positive effects throughout the economy. But remember, there's sort of a there, there's a difference between the overall condition of the economy and the condition of one particular sector. Yeah. And if we use government policy to keep prices artificially high for farmers, well, that means higher prices that consumers pay for food, less money that those consumers have to spend on goods and services and so on. It's really just, it all goes back to the basic lesson of the yeah. book, The Broken Window Fallacy. Right. Okay. The argument that yeah. if we don't protect the farmers, the economy will collapse is no different from the argument that uh, uh, you know, what's good for one particular uh, piece of the economy is necessarily good for all of it. You know, it's the broken window all over it's again. It's also interesting, isn't it, that so much of this, I, guess, I don't know if you would call it Keynesian macroeconomic theorizing or whatever it is behind there. It's yeah. partially Keynesian, I suppose. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Good out of, the, out of the experience of the Great Depression right. when it was why they believed that the falling prices were causing... Yes. Yeah. The no, that's absolutely right. right. Okay. And I mean, it, it makes sense... It, 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 in a sort of common sense, intuitive way, if I'm a business person... And the prices, you know, and I can't get a high price for the, the products that I sell. Well, clearly that's bad for me. And that's, you know, I, I'm in poor economic shape if I can't get a high price for the things that I want to exchange on the right. market. But it doesn't follow from that that the, that it's not the fact that prices are falling for my, for, the, for my goods and services that is the cause of, you know, some sort of general economic, uh, uh, you know, economic problems, right. right? I mean, the falling prices are a result of, in this case, falling demand for right. the services of plumbers or the commodities produced by farmers or the salaries, uh, services of economics professors or whatever right. it might be. So there's a confusion of cause and effect. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, too, how uh, what's behind this macroeconomic theorizing 
is contrary to the interest of consumers because as consumers you always want to pay a lower price. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. That's right. And we're all producers and consumers right. in a sense. And it's just like any other, you know, a tariff to protect the steel industry, for example. If right. you look only at the steel industry, it looks right. like, wow, higher prices for steel, higher profits, they can pay yeah. their workers more and so on and so forth. Many people made that mistake. Exactly. Yeah. And you forget about the fact that all the users of steel are right. paying higher prices and that those effects essentially and it's not it's not just that they cancel each other out and are neutral, but the effects of the protectionist policy are actually harmful in the term in terms of you know distorting the uh, allocation of resources throughout the economy, directing resources artificially toward one particular sector right. and away from others, not in, which is not in the uh, according to the wishes of consumers as they spend. So would this be an example of of this fallacy at work? The argument that Walmart shouldn't come to a city, uh, come to a community, sure. because look what happens. You know the. The, the local merchants. Absolutely. You know, okay, so it's a version of the same kind of right. argument. They'll have to lower the prices, and we'll be able to make a profit, and they have to go out of business, and Walmart takes that, it. That's right. it. And remember, yeah. you know, Hazlitt's one lesson, that you have to see the whole yeah. uh, the, the whole story, the whole part, and uh, the whole system, and not just one part. Yeah. And of course, if we look at a mom-and-pop business that cannot compete with a more efficient, more effective, more productive Walmart, of course it's sad for that mom-and-pop industry. But if we stop the analysis there, we've lost... The, the the most important part, right. right? Namely, that everybody else is actually much better off yeah. with the presence of a store like Walmart. Right. Evidently so. Right. Or else they wouldn't they wouldn't go. That's absolutely they right. Wouldn't go, and Walmart would go out of business. It's interesting that you mention Walmart because the next chapter in the book okay. is titled uh, "Saving the X Industry." So the themes tie together. Exactly. Same okay. theme where he gives lots of examples of industries, steel, automobiles, whatever it is that claim to have a special standing in the economy. They're particularly important for economic prosperity. If this industry were to fall, well, then the dominoes will Milk begin to collapse. Or whatever. You, you know, yeah. and, uh, shoes, what would we be without shoes? And of course, it's very cleverly yeah. named saving the X industry because yeah. you can fill in the blank Everything's, any way you like. Yeah. Uh, you know, today, of course, it's the banking industry and the home mortgage industry. And oh my goodness, if we let uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae collapse, well, then something else will collapse and then the whole financial system will go under. Uh, if we, uh, uh, don't do something to stop foreclosures. All these people who uh, are uh, who lose their homes due to foreclosure, uh, you know, their uh, their uh, you know, economic condition will lead to these spillover effects to sort of the rest of the economy and so on. It was the same thing after 9/11. Remember the airline industry and sure. the insurance industry. We won't be able to said, visit our families of across not. over on the west coast. Right? It's the same thing. <laughs> and the point is, you know, every every argument like that you know, ultimately boils down to some kind of special pleading why the state should favor my industry as opposed to other industries at the expense of other industries in the economy. The reason I had a seg to that from Walmart is because I was thinking about this argument. People who say uh, we need to protect homeowners, we need to protect banks, we need right. to protect particular investment firms that heavy, bet heavily on these mortgage-backed securities and, right. and made the wrong bet. Yeah. You know, Walmart is a great example of a company that, you know, to the mass of consumers that it serves is, of course, heroic, but to most intellectuals, professors, journalists, and so on is a sort of you know, symptom of the evil of capitalism driving out the little guy and so on. But I think, suppose Walmart were to be in financial hardship. Suppose Walmart were to declare bankruptcy or you know, right. be on the verge of collapse. Do you think the same members of the intelligentsia would be crying for the government to prop up Walmart, to save Walmart? Because it really is true. Think of all these small rural communities that are served by Walmart and little else. If Walmart were to disappear right away, massive, masses of people throughout rural it's America and elsewhere in the world point. would be much worse off. Yeah. But I bet you wouldn't see the calls really? for Walmart well, because Walmart is so ten years, right? politically. Oh, yeah, it could be. <laughs> see, cer certainly could be. And, of course, there is a, uh, you know, there are extra economic arguments typically brought into these kind of saving the X industry stories with steel or automobiles. Oh, people might make a national defense argument. If we don't have a healthy U.S. steel industry, if we buy all our steel from Korea or from Japan, from Japan, well, my gosh, what happens if the East Asians declare war on us? We won't have enough steel to build tanks and so on. In the case of agriculture, people say, well, you know, Agriculture is special somehow. It's part of the fabric of American society, right. the Jeffersonian ideal. We need to have uh, this, this sector has to be strong. It's important to have a strong agricultural sector, even if it's not purely for economic reasons, but just for sort of moral, spiritual, inspirational reasons. In fact, you do see 
that policy much more explicit in Europe, for example, where you know agriculture okay. ha having having beautiful little uh, you know communities. It's like uh, rural rural France. It's like Disneyland. Right, so the people who live in Paris and the big cities want to have the beautiful countryside to escape to, and they want to see a, a guy with a with a plow or a pitchfork, you know, the, the 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 yeoman farmer in his little cottage because it's part of the scenery. It looks pretty. It's, um, yeah. it's not a purely economic story; it's sort of a political and social story as well. And it's, it's why they keep out uh, these big big stores, big discount stores. Absolutely, all, all would, ru would ruin the landscape. <laughs> That's exactly right. But meanwhile, uh, unemployment's very yeah. high. I've actually uh, heard about a case where a place in Europe where uh, 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 there are popular bike, biking routes and where some local governments have put up fake cows and horses up on the hillside so that when the bikers are going by, they look off and they see this pastoral scene with the horses and the cows and so on, but they're actually just made of cardboard and they're off in the distance on the mountaintop really to funny. make it look more Is this uh, a romantic. Local, a, a virgin local <laughs> industry, the manufacturer so, of so. uh, you know, cardboard think, cows? You <laughs> might think they would wonder at some point why the cows never move. Yeah, right. Uh, can I ask you something um, about the whole question of falling prices of and doing business under falling prices? Um, you mentioned the computer industry earlier. Mm -hmm. What are the kinds of challenges that an industry faces right. under these conditions? Sure. Well, it's extremely difficult because you not only have prices falling, but just the fact that prices are so uncertain. Right. It's it's it's, it's pretty. E it's much easier to run uh, uh, to be in business as an undertaker, where you know demand and supply conditions are relatively stable, than it is to be in a rapidly changing. Industry like IT, where there's you know all sorts of technological innovations coming down the road. On the other hand, we have to keep in mind when we talk about falling prices in the computer business, for example, it's not just the price of the PCs that Dell or Apple or uh, HP or Lenovo sell uh, to consumers, but also the prices of the intermediate products that go into the computer are falling as well. Less for the final manufacturers, have to pay are paying less for the. Products, Absolutely. Right. Okay. So it would be bad for Dell if output prices were falling, but input prices remained the same. Right. Then Dell would be in an increased, you know, there, there would be a squeeze. But of course, the prices of, the, of memory and, and hard drives and the, the LCD okay. screens, right? All of the components, those prices are falling too. But you have too. to be very careful about inventory, then, don't you? Oh, absolutely. Is that, is that one of the factors that you just an extreme attachment sure. to the whole question of you have to just right. have very good short-term forecasts? No, no. I think that's exactly right because if. I mean, think of the if, if the manufacturer were to stock up on a bunch of components when the component prices are high and not use them until the yeah. price of the computers has fallen, right. it would be a difficult thing. But that's why we see in industries like that a move towards the sort of you know just in time manufacturing model where that where inventories are kept very low, yeah. uh, precisely because there's so much price volatility. And of course, Jeff, remember there are other things that uh, business businesses can do. They can try to reduce price variability. Uh, through long-term contracts with suppliers and with customers, uh -huh. so you know companies like uh, uh, computer companies like Dell, for example, you know uh, most of their business is not simply sales to computers, but sales to large companies, government uh -huh. agencies, universities, and so on. And they often have long-term contracts with those clients, which can uh, you know where some prices can be specified ahead of time. So of course, doing business in a highly volatile sector of the economy is challenging, but there are many opportunities there as well. It leads to um, increases in efficiency, doesn't it? Oh sure. Yeah. I mean, we as consumers, we just sit and enjoy the ride, yeah. right? Ultimately, it doesn't matter to me a lot whether it's Dell or Lenovo yeah. or HP or whoever manufacturing the computer. I mean, my goodness, look what I get! Look at all the goodies I get to consume. They're they're competing with each other, dog eat dog, in a, a highly competitive world in which their margins are getting smaller and right. smaller. But hey, it's great for the consumer. And it, it must be good for them ultimately, or else they, I mean, they could easily leave the industry, right? There's nothing exactly. forcing anybody to be a computer exactly. manufacturer. Exactly. That's, exa that's exactly. And the right. same is true in other industries. Uh, agriculture. Sure. We could. It would be. It would survive oh, sure. under falling prices. I mean, an additional problem with the argument for propping up Industry X is that it sort of locks. You know, it, it sort of locks locks us into, uh, you know, the, the way the economy is at the point that that legislation comes into place, where we may wish things to be completely different. Right. You know, so the obvious example that that I use in class all the time is imagine that, you know, if we had when the automobile first came around, if we had special protection for horseshoe manufacturers, you know, blacksmiths. Uh, the people who scooped up after the animals in the roads and so on. Uh, sure, it would be good for for people who are employed in that sector. But how would you like to be riding a horse and you know driving a horse-drawn buggy today as opposed to the automobile? 
Really, the point is with the the computer business. I mean, again, think how rapidly things change. Who knows what kind of computing devices the the, the market will give us in twenty years, ten years, even five years. If we were to try to sort of keep things the way they are right now to have some short short term stability, we might lose out in a huge way in the long term. So, how would you how would you speculate what would, ha what would happen to the housing industry if prices yeah. just continue to fall? What sure. happens? Well, I mean, look, uh, there are a couple different possibilities. I mean, if if sort of current uh, uh, if people's preferences for how they live and where they live and so on were to remain basically unchanged, well, there's going to be a demand for housing, oh. right? Now, on the margin, some people who own their own homes might prefer to own condominiums or to be renters and so on. But, you know, it isn't the case that we're all going to start living in these massive, you know, collective apartment buildings where we live in family units of a thousand people each or something like that. So presumably the, the sort of rough distribution of people between living in single family homes versus apartments and so on probably wouldn't change that much but uh you know there there might be different uh different entrepreneurs building the houses different financial institutions uh funding the houses and, and there might different be different financial terms. Might be different people living in the houses yeah. sure i mean it's one thing that is so frustrating about the current mortgage bailout is how grossly unfair it is to people of modest means who didn't buy a house because yeah. they thought it was more financially prudent to rent, for example, and their their friends of equal means who sort of recklessly purchased a house that they couldn't afford and yeah. signed an adjustable rate mortgage they didn't really understand and are now getting a, a, a subsidy check yeah. or are getting some kind of protection to, to bail them out. It's really unfair to the person who didn't make that choice. Right. So we would see some differences to be sure. And the renter who's, who's out on the housing market uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. would would Probably appreciate right. Right. housing prices that have fall, right. fallen a little bit more already. Yeah. You know, I mean, Jeff, you could turn the question around the other way and say, to, to, to the the person who advocates the subsidy, the protection, the bailout, yeah. essentially they're arguing that market market forces don't work in this particular case. Right. That you know, just as we had a, a, a horse and buggy industry at one point, and now we have an automobile industry, and there was a transition as technology changed as new resources became available, as consumer preferences changed, you know, we had a rapid, sudden, dynamic shift from, you know, having one type of industry being prominent to having a new industry being prominent. Same thing with computers and aerospace and lots of other industries that we see. Well, what, you know, is, if that's a bad thing, if there's, uh, if we don't think the market can adequately meet people's demands and can adequately adjust for changes in, you know, for technological breakthroughs, well, I think the burden of proof ought to be on the critic to explain why the market doesn't work in that case. Yeah. Why can't the free market handle housing? Why can't the free market hand or handle food? Why can't the free market handle automobiles or clothing or computers or anything else? Instead, usually the burden is put on the defender of the market to explain why this regulation isn't needed. Right. Well, okay, fine. That's the that's the world we're in. That's the game we have to play. But and sometimes it's fun to turn it around yeah. and put the shoe on the other foot. And isn't it interesting how we're somehow only now paying the price for this? Policy that began sometime after World War II. Absolutely, it isn't it remarkable? And again, I think there's a there's an extra economic aspect to this too. There's this sort of romantic notion of yeah, the yeah. post-war baby boom notion of the yeah. high house and the white picket fence and the yeah. 2.5 kids and the car in the garage and so on. And of course, that's a wonderful thing. And uh, there's nothing wrong with having that sort of vision. Each of us individually having one vision or another of how we want to live. Yeah. But the use of government policy to promote one particular lifestyle, one particular uh, you know, ha housing choice doesn't seem to be justified. And when Hazlitt speaks about thinking about the long-term implications of policies, in this case, the long term is something like sixty years. That's right? absolutely right. Remarkable. That's right. And again, we have to. That's another. As as you you good, what, do well to remind us that Hazlitt, when he talks about looking at the big picture, it's you know the overall economy at any one point in time, and also looking at the long run consequences. Again, think of housing. Uh, you know, uh, sort of the, the legislation that's just working its way through Congress now, right? This massive yeah. bailout policy. Trillions. You know, people. Yeah. And so they're not at all looking at the, the obvious long-run consequence of encouraging irresponsible behavior. That's, I don't know what else to call it. Mm. Anytime you have an industry like housing, airlines, automobiles, whatever it is, that is perceived to be, quote, too big to fail, there's an implicit, anytime there's an implicit government guarantee to protect you and if you run into hard times, well, of course that's going to affect behavior, right? The economists call that moral hazard. 
but in layman's terms, we would call it, you know, irresponsible or uh, inappropriate behavior. Yeah. Sure, of course, if I know my downside is covered, I'm going to engage in a lot more risky behavior than I would if I had to bear the consequences of my own action. And people talking about this legislation today, most of its advocates are completely ignoring these long-run consequences of encouraging malinvestment in the future. Because you know the taxpayer is always going to come and pick up the tab. Well, we've got the solution. Read the book. Right? Absolutely. Highly recommend it to all of your uh, viewers. Thank you for explaining all this to us, Peter. My pleasure. Great to be with you, Jeff. Okay. Well, this is Jeffrey Tucker. I'm here again with another installment in our series on Economics in One Lesson. We're going chapter by chapter. And this morning we have Guido Hulsman, the author of uh, Mises, The Last Night of Liberalism. So it's a great pleasure to have you, Guido. It's a great pleasure to be with you, Jeffrey. And so we're talking this morning about how the price system works. And it's always occurred to me that this is the most underrated all, of all market institutions, the price system. Hardly anybody really understands it. And yet we use it every day, right? That is true, and uh, Hazlitt explains very well that it's not really, I mean, not only how prices work, but the interrelations that exist between prices, and in particular between industries. If one industry uh, flourishes, for each single industry, its uh, fate depends on the relationship between its, its cost expenditure and its selling receipts, uh -huh. which must be good. But precisely the, the crucial point is that both costs and selling receipts are interdependent with the costs and selling receipts of all other industries. How's that? So if one industry uh, flourishes, for example, because there's an additional consumer demand for it, so there's additional spending going on in this industry, so it can expand its activities, it means that consumers who spend more money on this must necessarily spend less money elsewhere in the economic system. So other industries experience a decrease in their selling receipts relative to cost expenditure, so their activity shrinks. It is, of course, possible to have general growth, the general growth of all industries, which results from savings, as Hazlitt explains in other chapters of his book. Right. But the crucial point is uh, that we, in order to pro properly understand the economic system, we always need to keep in mind the interdependencies that exist between all parts of the economic system and not just look on one part of it. Yes. Well, can you give us a definition of uh, the word price? What is a price? A price is an exchange ratio in which two quantities of, of goods are being uh, exchanged, and uh, one of them is money. Okay. And, uh, uh, and can we imagine a world without prices? Sure, we can imagine a world without prices. We can imagine a world of uh, individuals uh, living in isolation from one another and just caring for their own business, not cooperate with other people, never exchange a single bit. But of course, such a world could not be very populous because people would live in great misery, as we can understand. <laughs> if from, they live at all. <laughs> if they live at all. Yeah, well, in, in some particularly uh, well-endowed uh, areas, Africa, uh, Latin America, and so on, some parts of the United States where nature is generous and so on, there people could live off uh, just the fruits hanging on the trees and so on, so live a lot, uh, hand into the mouth existence. But uh, most other areas of the world where precisely Western civilization has emerged, uh, Europe, uh, Northern America, and so on, it would not be possible yeah. to live such a life. Uh, so any kind of extended or complicated form of human cooperation requires prices. It does require price, right? The only other logical alternative would be to imagine that we organize a division of labor by a central plan that has been tried out in the Soviet Union and its uh, satellites. And as uh, economic theory, Ludwig von Mises' theory has uh, explained and as ex historical experience has shown, this doesn't work. Who makes prices? People exchanging on the market. Every single one, you go to a bakery shop and pay a, a bread, uh, you create a price. Who, who creates a price? The consumer? 
it's the consumer and the seller. Uh -huh. So and the, the price is never just fixed by one person. Sometimes we say it's a colloquial way of uh, speaking. Uh, there's some price fixing on, going on by the companies, which means in practice that the companies say, well, we will not sell our commodity at any other price but this one. Uh -huh. But then, of course, that by itself does not yet give them uh, the opportunity to really exchange it. Only if they find customers who are willing to pay this, so who agree with this price, then it, the price comes into being. I could say, well, I set up a shoe factory and say, well, my shoes are so nice. I mean, their price is a million dollars. Okay, that's not yet a price. It's just a, a slip of paper that uh -huh. I attach to, to my shoes and it says one million dollars. Uh -huh. But that's not a price. Uh -huh. you know, a price comes into being once one appreciative gentleman, such as yourself, for example, uh -huh. pops into my shop and then actually gives me one million dollars uh -huh. for the shoes, okay. which I hope very much. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so... Um, so the price is established in real exchange. It has to actually happen. Yes. Otherwise, it is what it's an offer or it's a. It's a just hot, hot air. Hot air. Um, now, uh, I was at the bakery a couple of days ago, and there was a sign that said, um, "Look, we very much regret that we've had to go up slightly on our prices." And uh, I thought that was intriguing, um, because of course the bakery doesn't really want to go up on its prices. It wants more revenue. Yes. But it knows that any increase in price causes... Exactly. Causes fewer of its goods to be sold. Yeah. So you can interpret this uh, uh, sign in, in various ways. They might actually regret themselves. We re regret ourselves very much to, to have to increase our prices to still have a margin as compared to our cost. And then they cannot be sure that they still will have enough business to uh, create them some, some profit. Yeah. And uh, consumers... Uh, of course, always and everywhere we want to pay how much for all of their goods and services? Excuse me? How much do consumers want to pay? Well, we, we, we cannot generalize this. The, the fundamental fact is that consumers have to choose between different items right. that they would like to buy, shoes and clothing and uh, food stuff, and they have to pay for housing and so on. And the, the price that they are ready to pay for one, any one item, of course, depends on the prices they yeah. have to pay for other things. Well, I recall being, I was once buying a, a car, and uh, this car salesman said to me, well, how much do you want to pay for this car? And my answer was, I, I mean, it was a very obvious answer, zero, right? Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> you might have reminded him of some essentials of economics. <laughs> I mean, and I was perfectly aware that he wanted to charge a billion dollars for this yes, car. You know, yes, so the, the yeah. problem was finding something. In yeah, so he had a good laugh and then you got to the matter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess, that, I guess that's it. Yeah. Now, um, what about this idea, um, or you'd already mentioned central planning, but why can't uh, uh, an agency... Um, set a price? Why can't, why can't uh, some external uh, third party uh, coercively just attach a price to a particular uh, good or service? Well, they, they, again, they can of course say, well, this object, this commodity may only be exchanged at this or that rate. Uh -huh. And you may call this a price. I think we have to, would have to make the distinction between a market price and a fiat price. Okay. okay. So why doesn't this work for all uh, goods? Well, uh, precisely because uh, all goods are interdependent with one another and um, their proper relationship cannot be determined by purely theoretical means. It's a very important insight that comes from Austrian economics. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not an engineering problem where we have a certain number of variables and then you plug this into a model and you, you get a certain result. I see. Because in human action, we have the fundamental problem of anticipating future conditions. Yeah. Most of our markets are not actually markets for consumer goods, right. but are markets for producer goods. So we're talking here about the cost side of production right. in a relation to consumer goods industries. But of course, uh, so the uh, producer goods markets are, let's say, 80% of the economy consumer goods markets are just about 20%. Yeah. Now, the prices for producer goods have to be determined in regard to what you expect to be the case in the future. Yes, right. So ultimately, it's a judgment that we have to make on the future. We do not have a scientific model that would allow us to predict or to determine exactly the future. Now, there are certain conventions, aren't mm. there, in the business world about what a price will be. Uh, you calculate all your costs and you figure mm. out what, what mm. kind of... Uh, mm. uh, uh, margin uh, revenue you need, mm -hmm. what kind of margin of revenue you need to mm -hmm. make this continue to be profitable, and you set it. And that's a convention, right? 
You can call it that way. It's it's a, a practice that is uh, informed by business schools, for example, uh -huh. uh, standard teaching economics, and so on. Or even just if you're just a regular businessman. You, you, yes, yeah. mm -hmm. yes. But uh, again, uh, it's not accounting that gives you the the proper price. Mm -hmm. Account is the other way around. Uh, the proper way to evaluate the assets that you have on your balance sheet is to first look what is the, the monetary value of the product that can be generated with the help of these assets yeah. in the future. Now this judgment is, judge, is just that. It's, it's a judgment. It's not something that results from a scientific inquiry. Right. But it's your good guess as an entrepreneur. It's your bet on the right. future. Now, precisely because we have no possibility to do this with a mathematical model, but yeah. because we have to bet, uh, we need, uh, there's only one way to make this betting process responsible, namely by creating property rights and by making sure that the consequences of a bad choice fall back on the, the person who yeah. makes it. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, you mentioned fiat prices versus market prices. Yes. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, now, uh, if a government agency, for example, the post office, well, let's pick a different one. Um, let's say you have a... Uh, uh, an agent, a housing agency mm. that's putting, it's building houses and putting them on the market, mm. and they use what they consider to be a business convention to establish what the prices are. Mm -hmm. You know, they might might observe well. The housing industry tends to uh, buy things at this price and sell things at this price, and mm -hmm. we'll just do the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're saying that that really ultimately is a, is, is is an arbitrary judgment. It's well, if if they if they impose these supposed exchange exchange ratios yeah. on the entire industry, whatever the particular conditions are, yes, that would be an improper way of handling. And then what this. happens? Well, then we get to the the chapter in uh, which has it deals with uh, price controls. Right? If the price is set arbitrarily at a level different from the level it would attain in the free market exchange uh -huh. economy, then you get surpluses and shortages. What is meant by this idea that all prices are past prices? Well, it means that uh, as long as we do not actually perform the exchange, we do not know what the price is. Uh -huh. So... And then, of course, as soon as, we, as soon as we know the price, well, it's a past price. We go to in the, in the bakery shop and you buy the bread for a dollar. Only once you've actually paid the price and got the, the bread, you know what the price for That's the bread history. is. And then it's, of course, already a past price. Yeah. Uh, let me mention also in this context that what businessmen are most concerned about is not necessarily the price. It's uh, the total selling proceeds and the total cost expenditure. Right. So we should not forget that, the, of course, the, the price is relevant because it determines also the quantities that are being uh, exchanged. What the businessman is mainly interested in is, is the volume generated as compared to the volume that he needs to right. expand. And this is true whether it's a medium-sized business, a huge business, or a lemonade stand. On the oh, we have right. a true economic principle. Right. Yeah. It's the same thing no matter what size the exactly. business is. Exactly. And uh, in this sense, uh, the bigger business has no real advantage, does it? No. Yeah. No. I mean, ultimately, it's just a matter of you're just adding more zeros onto the same problem, yes. which is trying yes. to make... The problem <laughs> is always to properly anticipate what is the total selling proceed that you can realize with a given investment. And then in relation to this, go on the market and try and see whether you can buy the factors of production necessary to bring this result about. Hire the proper workers, right. uh, rent the, the right uh, office space at the right location, and so on. Now, Hazlitt wrote this chapter, uh, 1946, which wasn't too many years. Well, let's say it was before Hayek's work on prices, and it was after Mises' um, detailed work on economic calculation. So would you say um, that Hazlitt's um, presentation of these chapters um, is based uh, on a Misesian perspective of, of prices? Hayek published his uh, famous article on the use of uh, knowledge in society in 1945, which okay. was a year before the publication, okay. first publication of Hazlitt's yeah. essay. So you could say that this might have had an impact, especially since he knew, of course, Hayek, yes. at least by correspondence. Hayek actually did come to the U.S. for the first time in 1945, I believe, uh -huh. to promote his book, The, the Road to Serfdom. Uh, yeah. Or in 1946, I don't remember very well. Uh -huh. So, I mean, their personal context was, uh, uh, contact was not very frequent, not very strong. Uh -huh. So probably Mises had a, a much more definite impact on his thinking. Again, if you look at these chapters, 
how price determines uh, the economy. It, it's very Bumbawerkian, right? Uh -huh. so the great subject of Bumbawerk's uh, capital and interest, a great treatise, capital and interest, yeah. in which he stresses this point. The great contribution of Bumbawerk to Austrian economics was to create uh, an analysis of the economy as a whole. Karl Menger had just analyzed the process of price formation for individual prices and talked not very much about the relationships between different prices. That was the great contribution of Bumbawerk's and Mises was, of course, the most important disciple of, of Bimbawerk, and you find these central ideas reflected in all of his works. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. So you would say that the has this chapter here is more Bimbawerkian. Bimba it's very Bimbawerkian. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's great. And, of course, that's a fundamental contribution of Austrian economics that is unfortunately totally neglected by the mainstream today, was not neglected in the early 20th century, when Bumbabek was still widely read among economists all over the world, but unfortunately now with this an unfortunate uh, concentration on partial equilibrium analysis or the unilateral focus on individual prices, individual industries, this whole message gets lost. What about uh, the next chapter? We're talking about stabilizing commodities. It's a subject that becomes, again, of great importance in our day. We only need to think of the oil industry and uh, the, the rents against the speculators on the market. It's, it's an eternal subject. You know what the most important field of literature was in economic literature up to 1850, say? What the most important economic policy problem was? Declining prices? No, it was wheat, the wheat, the wheat. market. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And, and uh, how to stabilize the wheat price and could the market do it or not. Mm -hmm. This was about 40% of all economic writings concerned oh, this problem. So that's very, very interesting yeah. because I don't know if you've had a chance to pick up um, this, and you, I highly recommend it, this Garrett, Garrett novel called Satan's Bushel. I, no, I do not yeah, take Which deals entirely with yeah. the whole wheat problem. But you do get the sense when you're reading that, that wow, this wheat stuff, is, this wheat problem is a big deal because, yes. because farmers felt like they couldn't really make, yes. it, make a living or they'd try to sell at a high price. But since they all sold at once, then the market would be flooded and the prices would go down. Yeah. And, uh, so they're trapped by the market and the government the needs to protect them. And, and did. You need loan, loan programs that allow the poor farmers to hold back their, their wheat and sell it in a more a proper point of time and so on. And All there were these wheat ideas. cartels, like the farmers were trying to yes. get together, but there yes. was always an, invariably a one or two uh, that would. Uh, break the price by secretly adding their bushels to the market. Yes, and it, it is really not necessarily to the, it's, it might be to the advantage of the sub-marginal, that is the, the inefficient producers, but it's never in the interest of the efficient producers and of the consumer. Yeah. Well, the Garrett uh, book deals specifically with the advent of futures markets as, as the uh, way to deal with, uh, with the price problems. Yeah. But um, what has its argument is that uh, that uh, stabilizing prices is not really, stable prices is not an ideal that we want to try to seek to achieve, right? Yes, because prices should, of course, reflect the changing conditions on the market. If you have one uh, market segment that becomes increasingly important, let's say now the computer industry in, yeah. in the past 25 years, then you do not want to keep the prices where they were in 1980. They should reflect the ongoing changes in the volume of demand, for example, and the type of good that is being offered there. But the general perception is that we can't permit an industry that's absolutely critical to the overall economic, macroeconomic structure to just uh, go through some sort of enormous upheaval suddenly, for yes. example, housing, because that mm. will drag the economy down with it. Mm. Well, that's, of course, uh, it's precisely opposite around, the opposite way around. The more important an industry is, the more important it is that prices be flexible. And of course, we should not forget, and that's a point that is also stressed by Hazlitt, that uh, the, the question how important a good is, is not liable to find a general answer. It is answered for, by each indi individual, each household, differently. So each household needs to be determined how much money do I want to spend, on housing, how much money do I want to spend on food, and so on. We, we cannot uh, say this, I mean, your budget should be 30% in housing, and then 20% on food and various other items. There are people who have completely different preferences. 
I always think in this context of a good friend of mine uh, during my university years when I was a student. And so you're very, we were all very poor, of course. And some of them, they, they spend 50% of their budget on theater tickets. So what do you do about this? Do you want to impose on them and say, well, you've got to spend 50% on housing, you have to have a better apartment. They were living in a, in a, in a, in a very shabby place, but yeah, they accepted this. There was, were more important things for them to, to buy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this underscores the absurdity of uh, something like uh, speaking of a price level for the whole economy, doesn't it? Well, what is important for the functioning of an economy is not the level of prices. Of course, we can always construe a mathematical average of all prices, and that's uh -huh. possible. You can observe uh, the evolution of this aggregate of this basket throughout time. That uh -huh. is possible. Uh -huh. But what is important for the functioning of, of the economy, for its operation, are the relations between prices and, again, more precisely, the relations between spending streams. Yes. An industry flourishes not if the price level is high. An industry flourishes if the level at which it has its selling receipts is superior to the level of ex cost expenditure, whatever the segment of the economy. Yeah. Therefore, an economy can function very well at a high level of expenditure, at a low level of expenditure, at an increasing level of expenditure and at a decreasing level of expenditure. It never matters what the level is. It always matters only is there a positive spread between selling prices and buying prices. And that prices. requires absolute freedom of, of, of adjustment of prices. And precisely if you have variations, yeah. if you have uh, systematic changes, increases of the price level, for example, and decreases, the market must be free yeah. in order to adjust to this. And so there are many markets, probably I don't know, fewer, it seems, than in the past, in which uh, the government fixes the price. Uh, maybe this is more common in France than in the U.S. It seems like price fixing is not so much practiced in this country, except for the government-provided goods and services. Yes. You know? but of course, you have, you have rent control and things like that. And, and it is not important today, in 2008, as it has been, say, in 1975. Yeah. So in those days, of course, we had uh, very high inflation rates, and in America, you had the Nixon administration yeah. imposing a system it, of it price and rent control. It, it, it can. It always is. Yeah. Th bad things are always tried out again and again. Right. right. So they, what Hegel, the German philosopher, once said: the only thing that you learn from history is that you never learn from history. <laughs> People never learn from history. <laughs> yeah. So therefore, also the importance of uh, theoretical instruction, good economic training, because yeah. it's the principles. Yeah. that allow us to orient ourselves whatever, in a changing historical context. And there are, of course, always the emergency um, situations where the politicians uh, threaten uh, price controls and then don't actually impose them. And intimidate producers. Have you seen this? Yes. And intimidate. It constantly goes on. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. People to, to lower their prices. Or to raise their prices. Yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it happens well, to be. But the F effect is actually the same. Uh -huh. To the extent that they take this serious, it has yeah. very similar effects to an actual price control. Yeah, so that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. And so this goes on all the time. And even, um, I, I've wondered in the past how this affects uh, certain markets, it's just the prospect that there will be investigations, or prospect that there'll be, uh, for example, bad press you know, can have an impact. Oh, yes. Yeah, for, for, for Especially on financial markets, for yeah. example. And therefore... Uh, our government, both here in the U.S. And, and in Europe, our governments try to massage the news. Yeah. So they have uh, public relations agencies their own, and they also hire uh, private public relationships to produce good news about capital markets yeah, in particular. Yeah, prices going this yes. way or that way. Yeah. But we, we do have odd views, don't we, around, about prices. We carry around this view, for example, in the United States. Everybody's convinced that oil, uh, that the price of oil must be should be far lower than it is. Mm. But the price of uh, housing should be far higher than it is. Yes. You know? yeah. And uh, we just carry around these views with us without, yeah. without much thought yes. as, to, as to what it implies and just how arbitrary this is. Why is it that the price of oil should be lower? Well, from a psychological point of view, of course, it's, it's understandable. Everybody wants to sell at a high price and buy at very low prices. Yeah. So we would like to have the oil price to be low because it allows us to drive very large and all gas-consuming cars, and we would like to have the housing price very high because our wealth increases with it and so on. It's, it's understandable. And we had a situation in the past uh, six or seven years uh, in which precisely this happened. Housing went up and uh, gas prices stayed fairly 
uh, this fairly stable uh, level. So there is a temptation for people to think that's the normal state of affairs. And right. it should always be that, that way. Well, but uh, things are not always uh, that way. And in fact, from the point of view of Austrian economic analysis, the, the situation was rather illusory. It was an artificial result of uh, government interventionism in the economy that created a wrong impression for, uh, for people. And led to some degree of malinvestment. Led to, certainly to too much investment in the, in the housing market, yeah. too much consumption, because yeah. people believed that the increase of uh, their housing value would be permanent, so they were taking out equity you know, to pay for the un university fees of their children, buy a new car, spend a nice vacation, and so on. Yeah. And therefore actually were uh, consuming their capital and destroying wealth. Now, one of the things that seems to be missing from these chapters that you would normally find in a regular economics text is uh, uh, some kind of graphical analysis. Uh, this is just words. Yes. Do you think that, um, that, the, that the exposition uh, suffers any f for its lack of... Uh... Not in the slightest. Okay. I believe that it's, it's slightly irritating for those who have economic training today because they're precisely used to be confronted with graphical exposition in economic textbooks and in economic uh, ex explanation. But for all others who come from other strands of life, no, I don't think so at all. Yeah. They, they orient themselves perfectly and for them it's actually more difficult to find themselves, to orient themselves in a, in a diagram. Right. And Hazlitt's writing is, is a narrative. Crystal it's clear and rigorous. Too, yes. It? Yeah. yeah. It's a step by step. Yes. Yeah. And it shows precisely, yeah, we, we, do not know, we do not really need this. Think, for example, of the typical exposition of uh, price control in a neoclassical or mainstream textbook. Mm -hmm. It first of all illustrates a, an equilibrium situation on the housing market, for example, and then says, now let's suppose the government fixes the price below the equilibrium price. And then you can show with demand curves and supply curves that there is a non-intersection between the two curves at this point, so uh, demand is higher than, than supply, and you call this then a shortage. Very fine. Now, strictly speaking, that's not correct, because on the, the market is actually never in general equilibrium in any single individual market is virtually never an equilibrium. So the proper way to present the economic, economic law, the principle that is here at stake, is to say a price control has these consequences if it fixes the price below what the market would have established, irrespective of the question whether the market is in equilibrium or not. Yeah. You see, so Hazlitt is actually more accurate. Yeah in stating the economic principle, then you could do it with a graphical, the standard graphical exposition. And here he follows J.B. Say, doesn't he? Yes, and, doesn't well, previous yeah. uh, economists. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Guido, for your wonderful Great pleasure to be with you today. This is Jeffrey Tucker. We're continuing our series on Economics in One Lesson, the new edition from the Mises Institute. And I'm very excited to introduce George Reisman, who's joined us uh, to discuss unions and wages. Dr. Reisman. Well, very glad to be here, Jeff. Thank you for having me. So we first um, tackle the issue of minimum wage laws, the uh, almost universal confusion even after all of these years. What does Hazlitt say about minimum wage? Well, uh, his basic point is that minimum wage laws or any legislation that raises wage rates above the free market level causes unemployment. And uh, both of his discussions, I think, are excellent. And I don't know of any better book as an introduction to economics. And uh, I've taught from it uh, for many years in the past, always with very good results. I see. Uh -huh. And if you put his uh, chapters on minimum wage and unions together, uh, one of his main points is that uh, unions cannot raise wage rates for all workers taken together. The most they can do is raise uh, wage rates for some groups of workers, 
they cause unemployment in those particular fields. For example, if a carpenter's union raises the wage rates of carpenters, there'll be fewer carpenters employed. The unemployed carpenters will then have to seek employment somewhere else. That enlarges the supply of labor elsewhere, and in order for them to be absorbed, wage rates in the new lines where they enter have to go down. So uh, the unions make a gain for the carpenters who keep their jobs, but impose a loss on uh, workers elsewhere in the economy. And then if, uh, well, you see, if, if we have uh, unions throughout the economic system, uh, the unions in the higher areas of skill uh, force certain workers out into lower lines. Uh, that either depresses the wage rates in the lower lines, or if they have unions, the uh, more skilled, better qualified workers cause less skilled workers to be unemployed. They then go down a rung lower, and then it concentrates at the bottom, where you have the minimum wage laws, and uh, then you simply end up with permanent unemployment. Now, you know, uh, many people who advocate repealing the minimum wage laws uh, don't realize uh, they, they hear the opposition, well, the, uh, the wage rates will be horrendously low uh, to absorb the unemployed. Uh, the unemployed could be absorbed on much better terms if the repeal of minimum wages was coupled with the repeal of pro-union legislation, mm -hmm. because then more people would be employed higher up the ladder. That would take the pressure off uh, the bottom. Now, back in 1946, unions were far more prevalent oh, yes. than they are today. Right. And I did a review of uh, an edition of, uh, of Economics in One Lesson that came out, I think, in 1981. And uh, I reread the book at that time. And one of the things I noticed was that here and there, there'd be some statement by Hazlitt, um, uh, unions on the whole are pretty bad and destructive, except, of course, when workers are being underpaid or whatever. And I made the point that these statements seemed totally out of place. And uh, I got a letter from Hazlitt, uh, who acknowledged that they, they were, they didn't really make sense, but he had to put them in here and there just in order to have the book published uh, when it appeared. Yeah. It was a different world, really. Yeah. Uh, almost, how much of the, uh, the economy was, how, many, how much of the labor force was unionized in 1946? It was 40%? Uh, possibly uh, uh, much, much Outrageous. higher than today. And something had to happen, didn't it? I mean, yeah. we were, it was on the verge of collapse. Yeah, well, or stagnation, uh, extreme stagnation. Well, the, they were certainly a, a growing problem. I guess yeah. uh, the Taft Hartley Act set them back somewhat, but uh, the natural effect of unions, uh, especially if the, the industries in which they predominate are uh, subject to foreign competition uh, or or non-union competition, uh, the union's effect is to destroy those industries. So a major reason that the United States has lost so much of its manufacturing is uh, the power of unions in such fields as automobiles, steel. Uh, you know, people complain, or used to complain more, about Monday morning cars, uh, because the workers would come in hungover from the weekend. <laughs> the good and, phrase, that's funny. Yeah. And uh, th that's a simple issue to solve. You know, you, you tell them either you come in fit for work on Monday or don't bother to come in at all. Yeah. And so they could have improved the quality. But they couldn't do that because such action would provoke a major strike. So the American automobile industry uh, lost greatly in competition because of the poor quality of the uh, cars produced by union workers, uh, their work rules that uh, lower productivity, uh, plus their wage demands, the pensions. Uh, I would say they're responsible in large measure uh, for the destruction of our automobile industry, our steel industry, and other major industries. I know here in Alabama we're benefiting uh, from this at some, in some way. We keep getting auto plants moving down, machines, yeah, small engines. so long companies. as they remain non-union. Yeah, and they move here because, because we don't have these kind of, we have open shop. Open shop. Open yeah. shop rules. And, and, uh, and so the same thing has happened on an international level. The capital chases the places that have relatively yeah. less restricted. Yeah, it places yeah. our industries at a great handicap. Yes. Right. Uh, now, what would you say to those, well, let me ask it this way. Are there any conditions under which uh, minimum wage laws or uh, laws favoring union organizations actually help workers? I overall? can't imagine any. Okay. I mean, they should be free to organize any voluntary association they want, 
but they should not have any right to prevent other people able and willing to do their jobs uh, at a lower wage. So this is a, a, a great confusion about this whole question of whether or not unions are voluntary or not. If you had a free market in labor, would we see anything like modern unions anywhere to your mind? I, I don't think we'd see uh, uh, unions organized for strikes and things of that kind. You might see uh, fraternal associations, yeah. you know, maybe people who work in the same plant. Uh, maybe they want to have a softball team or something or a burial fund or God knows yeah. what. Uh, but I, I don't think you would see anything... Uh, where they're uh, organizing strikes and stoppages. Right. Because so long, it would not be possible for any one group of workers to get significantly higher wages than other workers able to do their jobs. Right. So the guild, uh, is, the guild is just not likely to succeed over the long term, especially uh, not, not in the modern age. Exactly. Not, in, yeah. not under economic freedom. Right. Now, what about the next chapter? Uh, Hayek uh, um, Hazlitt talks about this idea of... Uh, Enough to, uh, the title is Enough to Buy Back the Product. And right. Quotations. What does he mean by that? Okay. Well, it's a popular argument of the unions, widely accepted, that uh, the source of demand for the products is from the payment of wages. Now, it's certainly true that uh, the, weight, the, the workers' expenditure of their wages is a huge source of demand for products, but uh, it cannot account for business profits, and you can't improve business profits by raising wages, and it's really a simple issue. On the one side, imagine that whatever wages are paid will be spent to buy consumers' goods, so they count as sales revenues, but on the other side, they count equivalently as costs. Now, if we add to the wages paid and the sales revenues, we're adding equals um, to whatever inequality we might have had. It doesn't increase the inequality. It doesn't add to profits. Now, as a matter of fact, uh, suppose we started out, we had a total spending to buy consumers' goods of 400 units of money. Each unit can be however many hundreds of billions of dollars or whatever, and 300 units of money spent to pay wages. Well, we could make reasonably estimate profits at 100. Right. Okay, now, if we raised wages by 100 and the workers spent all the wages, now we'd have 400 of wages, 500 of sales, Profits would still be 100, and as a percentage of sales and costs, they'd be lower. Right. Now, it, profit margins uh, would go up if total wages went down, and even if sales revenues went down, because we're subtracting equals from unequals, the amount of the inequality is unaffected and becomes a larger percentage. Now, also, uh, what I've one of the things I've discovered, suppose we have a situation where trying to recover from a depression, and that there's substantial unemployment and wage rates need to fall. Now, suppose uh, some of the funds previously used to pay wages are now instead devoted to the purchase of machinery. All right, there's going to be the same total sales revenues. Uh, the wage earners might spend less for consumers' goods, but more is spent to buy the machines. And for a protracted period of time, costs in the economy will be less because what you pay out as ordinary wages will show up as costs quite quickly, but if you're using those funds to buy a machine or construct a factory that lasts many years, the only element of cost is the depreciation. So profits would actually increase. And you see, this is what was typically believed. If you have mass unprofitability, as in a depression, uh, you need a reduction in wage rates, uh, in part to restore profitability. Yes. And it does so to the extent that expenditures are diverted to such things as machines and factory construction. Yes. And uh, do you expect that uh, right now we're entering in a recessionary environment? Do you agree yeah. with that? It certainly seems so. That the potential is there right. uh, for a major deflation. And we're starting to see uh, some response in the unemployment uh, rate, yeah. right? It seems yeah. to be going up. Right. So um, in, in light of, of your exposition and an and in light of Hazlitt, what do you expect needs to happen? Well, as, as far as uh, unemployment becomes an issue, the, uh, all legislation artificially propping up wage rates should be repealed. Yeah. But the, uh, an even bigger issue that would need to be dealt with is the uh, situation of the money supply and financial contraction. Yeah. And the potential is there right now. We, 
we could have something worse than 1929. I'm not saying we will, but the potential is there, does, and that would have to be addressed. Does Hazlitt address the question of unemployment insurance? Uh, he might, but I don't recall it. I don't. Maybe think you so. could elaborate uh, the, uh, elaborate on unemployment insurance. In well, uh, with unemployment insurance, if, if you mean uh, people when they become unemployed are right. getting are uh, getting government I say funds. Benefits, really. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. Naturally. Uh, well, that uh, enables people to avoid looking for work for a while, and it uh, prevents the fall in wage rates. You see, if you didn't have it, the pressure to reduce wage rates would be that much greater. Yeah. It would occur more quickly. Yeah. And in, in Britain, unemployment insurance, which was very elaborate in the 1930s, actually prevented uh, restoration of normal economic times. Yes. To, to even to a greater extent than the U.S. And yet, every time we go into a recession, Congress, Republicans and Democrats, are ready to right. jump in. And right. And now, one other thing I think is very important in this context uh, even if you have unions just in a few key industries, yeah. and they're in a position to prevent a fall in wage rates in those particular industries, yeah. uh, that operates uh, to necessitate a vastly greater fall in wage rates in other industries, because uh, when we try to expand production, we need to have expansion occurring more or less throughout the economy. Uh, like suppose we wanted to produce more automobiles, but uh, something was uh, acting, acting as a bottleneck in the production of copper. Yeah. Well, then uh, that greatly retards uh, our productivity in every area that depends on copper. So uh, if you have uh, unions in certain key fields wh which, whose expansion is being held back uh, in order to make the employment of people worthwhile elsewhere, you have to overcome this barrier of their productivity being artificially held down because of lack of supplies of complementary factors of production. Well, that's a very interesting point. Uh, so that even if unions constitute only, say, 5% of the private sector workforce... They could still do a lot of damage. A lot of damage. And now, I, I think they presently... I think it's more than 5 now. I think it's about 8 or 9%. Uh, to the extent that it's possible for workers easily to unionize, uh, employers don't want that to happen. So many non-union employers routinely match the union scales yeah. to avoid giving the workers a reason to unionize, which means that the union wage demands are much, much wide, have a much wider uh, influence than just in the unionized field. That would be an example of an unseen cost, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so they do, in fact, uh, serve to raise wage rates very, very broadly, far beyond uh, indicated by the percentage of their of their membership. Now, in the public sector, unions are far more prevalent. Why is that? Well, there, uh, the employers are not operating in a market. Uh, they're not uh, concerned with matters of profit and loss. Uh, they can pay anything, and the taxpayers end up footing the bill, yeah. and they're buying votes at the public's expense, and uh, they can run bigger departments. So... Uh, uh, there, I, I think a good case could be made. Uh, there should no unions should be allowed, certainly in uh, working for the government, because the, they're taking unfair. It's like taking advantage of a, of a person incapable of taking care of himself. <laughs> you know, the, the government has no profit and loss incentive. It's not its money. Right. So uh, the unions are dealing with someone who can't offer appropriate resistance, and those incentives are to constantly cater to them. So when we see those those public sector unions out protesting and demanding more wages, you should hold on to your wallet. Right? Yeah. 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 And they that's their area of growth because they destroy uh, one private industry after another. And so they in a way the unions are are vampire like because they need to find fresh blood uh, in order to prosper. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Reisman, for your exposition today, which is very clear and wonderful. Well, thank I have you. a hard time imagining that Hazlitt could be more clear than you are. Well, <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much. much. It's been my pleasure.
This is Jeffrey Tucker with our continuing series on Economics in One Lesson, the new edition from the Mises Institute, and we're here talking today with uh, Joseph Salerno from Pace University. Uh, we're covering two chapters, the function of profits, and then we get into an issue that's particularly important to us today, inflation. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, Joe. So, let's talk about the function of profits. Okay. What is the chapter about? The chapter basically points out that um, profits are a very small component of uh, national income, but they're the most important component because they're what motivates production. Uh, they're what motivates people to risk their livelihoods in order to attempt to forecast the future and future consumer needs and, and to um, take the steps necessary to adjust production, to, to, to come up with new ideas, new, new, new types of, of goods, new qualities, better qualities of goods, and also to relentlessly lower the cost of producing goods through, through the application of newly discovered technology. But now when you say motivates, what if an entrepreneur says, you know, I really just don't care that much about, the pro about profiting? What, what do you mean when you say motivating? Well, profit is an indicator of success. Many entrepreneurs like Bill Gates, uh, Sam Walton, Ray Kroc, if you, if you read um, their um, biographies or, or autobiographies about them, they, 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 they weren't motivated simply by money. They were, they were, they were motivated by the, uh, a need to um, more or less actualize the vision that they had of, 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 of a company that, that was serving consumer needs. So um, that's not to say that necessarily they were altruistic, but, but they, they were creative geniuses in a way that needed to, to um, actualize a vision that they had of, of, of producing a new good or a, a better good or a good at a much lower cost. In the case of, of, of Sam Walton and Walmart, bringing, um, cutting all unnecessary uh, costs, getting rid of all inefficiencies, and bringing products to consumers so at low prices. So you're distinguishing between a profit motivation and a money mo motivation. What That's do you mean correct. By that? Profit motivation um, is what motivates the entrepreneur in the sense that the entrepreneur is continuously scanning the market for undervalued resources yeah. and then with the intention of combining them and then bringing them to market in a much higher valued product. Okay. So, so this is, this is the, the motivation so, of the entrepreneur. So the profit serves then as a signal that he's done the right thing, that he's doing right. the right thing as, as, a, as, a, as a sign. Uh, to to indicate possible future actions, just as as a, a way of sealing up their their good work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it does signal success in, in what they've done, but um, they can't keep that success to themselves. That's the other thing. Pro profits are a signal in some sense, and they they grab the attention of other entrepreneurs um, and and who want to emulate these these entrepreneurs and similarly earn a profit. Yeah, and. Uh, and quite often these profits are uh, not just put into yachts and big boats and things like that, but turned back into the company. Yep. I mean, if you're going to expand, Absolutely. you have to have a profit. Right, right, right. right. For example, S Sam Walton was continuously you know, plowing his profits back into his, um, his firm. Um, for example, he himself uh, had a rule for, for all people traveling on company business. They would, only, they would always uh, share a hotel room. And when he traveled, he shared hotel rooms yeah. with, with, with one of his employees. <laughs> Yeah, no, you know, it's an interesting thing that if you could imagine a world without profit, you would have a, a world where business just continued to do the same thing. Right. And say there were no neither profits nor losses, you would have to just have a completely static economy. It would be a very stagnant economy. Uh, it would be a static economy. Actually, that's the definition of a static economy, an economy where there's no profits or losses. Right. Um, people can be changing their demands, and, 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 and firms would be changing um, products, increasing some, decreasing others, but there would be no, no growth in the economy without positive profits. Right. Um, and by the way, we can't leave out losses. Um, yeah. In this chapter, we discuss losses, uh, or Hazlitt discusses losses, and points out that fact that, that um, in, an, in an economy, uh, at nearly as many firms are losing money as are earning money, or as are earning profits, excuse me. Um, and we can see this last, last quarter, Ford lost $8.7 billion dollars. Um, because they were producing SUVs and uh, trucks that were not adjusted to the, the price of gasoline, so um, people were, were were reducing their demand. It signals a, a, a business mistake. Yeah, that signals a, a business, past business, business mistake, uh, a waste of resources. They are using resources that have a higher value to consumers in other areas than the product that is being produced. Yeah. So, I mean, if you were going to construct a system that said, well, you know, we need some kind of system in which 
uh, uh, people that are using uh, resources efficiently and serving others need to be somehow rewarded so they can continue to do that at a more expansive level than they had done before. You would put together something like the profit system. Yeah, that's what would come out of yeah. all of that speculation, if yeah. you thought about it. Yeah. But no one mind can reproduce that in any sense. So, so that's why uh, um, you know, public ownership of, of, or collectivist ownership under socialism can never work, because they, they can't really construct this, this very sensitive network of, of profits and losses. Yeah, inconceivable apart from, uh, from private property and free exchange. Absolutely. And a, and a free price system. Yeah, yeah. It, who was it that, that said that uh, cost accounting was the greatest invention in the history of the world? Well, that was Ludwig von Mises. Okay. Because, <laughs> I should know this. Yes, yes absolutely. <laughs> okay. Uh, because this is what allows a businessman to oversee all his operations to, 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 to reduce some areas, to, to um, get rid of some some of his managers that are that are not um, adjusting uh, to, to the conditions according to his own plan that he lays out for his whole business. Yeah, and uh, there have been socialist systems that attempted to replicate the profit loss system. Yeah, that's true. Um, they make up, uh, they use phony prices, or they copy the prices that they see on world markets, um, so they can crudely calculate in some sense um, in the real world. But, but no socialist system has actually used prices that were developed through a computer or um, through a trial and error method. There were many theories in the 1930s that the socialist society could replicate the market price system. Yeah. But that's already admitting, of course, that you need prices. Uh, but what they could never do is, 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 is replicate profits and losses. Right. Okay. But socialist businesses don't go out of business. Well, part, I suppose part of the problem is that just because you made a profit today or this week or last right. month or last year right. doesn't, doesn't really tell you anything for sure about the future. That's right? absolutely true. Um, IBM dominated um, the computer industry in the 1970s, and now they're simply a minor player in the computer industry. Um, you can you can think of, of of the big three automotive companies in the in the U.S. dominating auto production into the early 1980s, and now um, all three of them are, are are losing large amounts of money. And and GM is is cutting workers, and and Ford is closing down plants. So when you look at, when a when a business when a businessman looks at um, his accounting sheet and sees profits, it seems like it's a ratification only that in the past you've done well. But right. but um, it doesn't give you an indication of the, of, the, of what's going to happen in the future. You know, it's, it strikes me that the whole thing is relentless. Uh, the whole the whole project of enterprise, of productive enterprise, is relentlessly it's, terrifying. That's a good level. word. It is relentless. <laughs> um, there's a selective process going on uh, that that that's, that weeds out those people who are not currently serving consumers, yeah. uh, and it's done by consumers abstaining from buying certain products. And, and, and increasing their purchases of other products. And it, it is relentless, and it, 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 it takes no view of the past. It, it, it's just, it's, 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 it's concerned with what is going on right now. Am I being satisfied by these products right now? And uh, does the more profitable enterprise have, in some sense, an advantage, of the large business, have an advantage over the small business in this respect? Uh, that's not, no, not, not at all. In fact, um, again, uh, uh, the, uh, the person who earns a profit is, is the person we call the entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur can always come up with new ideas, and um, these, these can be um, hatched, these new ideas, in garages, as, as Apple, uh, under uh, Stephen Jobs was. Right. And Apple came from nowhere to, to outcompete um, IBM in, in, in personal computers. Uh, and Microsoft similarly came from, with operating systems. It was, it was, it was a tiny company. Uh, which exploded um, because it, it served consumers, so um, uh, exploded with success is what I, what I was intending to mean there. And, and so you, you, a big company, can, unless it has some kinds of government regulations and privileges, cannot um, continue its success without continuously changing its products according to consumer and, demand. And profitability becomes more and more difficult, too, with the large business because you've got ever higher costs. Right. right. Your costs are high, you have higher sunk costs, you're not as nimble, you're not as flexible, you can't move around this quickly, whereas a new business can easily adopt a new technology and um, can, can, can change its production in a moment's notice. And, and it must be especially difficult nowadays with technology constantly uh, moving forward all the time. And if you get attached to a certain way of doing things that's profitable, you think, right. well, we just need to do that again. And you turn around, you wake up the next day and everything's different and your competitors are using something that, that uh, does the work twice, twice as much work at that's half right. the cost. Yeah, you often hear about an entrenched corporate culture, there's a certain culture, and some people hold this up as being good, but the fact is the culture has to change according to consumers' uh, demands and according to technological conditions and, and, and cost conditions. 
So how how do how do these large businesses keep up? I suppose the the cost accounting is 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 always the signal, always the right. Cash. It is always the, the signal, the and and uh, the past always does give them some information about. Uh, uh, about experience, and then they they, they, they they judge this, they analyze it, and they try to extrapolate and forecast consumer demand in the future, technological conditions in the future, and so on. Now, uh, uh, we're speaking about profit as if it's uh, just one thing, but there's a range of profitability, right? That's absolutely true. Yeah. And uh, the more profitable industries will tend to inspire uh, uh, others to emulate them. Right. Yeah, that, that's true. I mean, you, you have, uh, as we had with the, with the high tech industries, expanding um, and, and, and becoming more profitable, even as prices have fallen and there's been a tremendous expansion in, in, in their output. There was something, uh, the first personal computer was $20,000 in 1980. We can now get personal computers for $500. Yeah. The shipments were half a million in 1980. By 2000, uh, even though the prices were much lower, they were producing and shipping something like 11 million units. Yeah. You know, I think about this all the time because, uh, just as a, a, our own internal example, which is just minor and to completely petty, but you know that for years people were advocating that the Mises Institute have uh, s small flash disks that were customized that said the Mises well, Institute. I looked into the prices and uh, I, I was terrified to buy them in January because you have to buy a certain quantity. I thought, how many of these things can right. I sell? By the fall, uh, you know, uh, and... Uh, well, six months later, you looked at the at the cost of these things, and they had fallen by half. And then a full year later, they were really ten percent of what. Now, uh, if we had bought that inventory at the beginning right. and not sold it, I mean, that's a, 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 just a potential disaster waiting to happen. I don't, I don't, frankly, understand how these companies can do this. Well, it's just as you pointed out before, it's 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 the fact that the competitive process, driven by profit motivation, is relentless. And one way to make profit is to continually lower your cost. On the same product that you're producing, right? So this is why we have a continual fall in prices in, in, in the high tech industry. You know, I think we tend to think of entrepreneurship as a one-time thing. You know, like somebody has an idea, here's a product people are liking, and right. you come up with it, you market it, and it sells. And but it's really it's a daily thing, isn't it? Right. It absolutely is. You're continuously continuously fine tuning the product itself and 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 the pricing um, uh, process that you're using, or the pricing procedures that you're using to price the yeah. product. You can look at the airlines where. Prices are continually changing. They're continually changing the space between the seats, the, what they're feeding you, and so on. Yeah, but I suppose that you have to have a certain uh, kind of personality to thrive on that, on that, on that, that kind of relentless uh, roiling around every day, that sense of uncertainty and terror. Really, yeah. <laughs> what's tomorrow going to look like? You have to be willing to risk your 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 livelihood and even yeah. your destiny um, uh, with, with the. Very optimistic expectation that that you can do better than than your rivals in, in serving consumers, and so entrepreneurs are fundamentally optimistic, and some of them may be overly optimistic. Yeah, but but that that is one of their important traits. Yeah, so not everybody is is capable of this, and it's a selective portion right. of the it's population. A, absolutely, and right. the benefactors really to the rest of us. Oh, absolutely, yeah, no doubt about that. Now the next chapter concerns the issue of inflation, and maybe as a segue, you could just. Mentioned, we're we're experiencing some inflationary times right now, uh, focused on particular sectors, you know, in oil and other things, but everything. Um, how does this affect? How does inflation affect uh, doing business? Inflation falsifies cost accounting because when the entrepreneurs look around, they see that prices have risen and that uh, their costs, which are are recorded at, at their historical levels, are much lower. So they seem like they have profits, but these turn out to be paper yeah. profits. Because they have to uh, replace these raw materials and the machinery and so on at much higher prices later on. And so um, inflation causes a misallocation of resources. In fact, it causes a consumption of capital. As people begin to spend these profits on consumption goods rather than, than put them aside with the intent of spending them on, on replacing their capital at higher prices. And why would it? Why would it? Why would it bias us towards consumption as opposed to? Investment? Well, because it, as I said, uh, profits look much higher. Okay. Uh, because, because the costs are, are, are things that you are recorded at pre-inflation prices. Yeah. There's a, a, there's a conservative bias in accounting, which 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 records costs at their historical level. Mm -hmm. And so when inflation breaks out, prices are the first thing to rise, and entrepreneurs see higher profits. And they they might plow some of this back into their their um business, but in fact, they have to pull all of it back in to take account of the fact that the costs, when they replace these inputs, are going to be much higher. Then they have to worry about um, selling prices, right? 
In, in what sense? I mean, uh, then they have to raise their prices for consumers, and they don't know how that's going to affect the demand for the product. Well, exactly. Um, with inflation, it's, it's called, it's ragged or uneven. That is, some prices are affected more than other prices. And at times, some consu uh, uh, industries will suffer in inflation. That is to say, the, the money that's being spent on their industry will not yet will lag behind the, the spending on other industries. So they will not be able to raise their prices as quickly as their costs are going up. So they, they will be squeezed, and yeah. um, they'll have to reduce production. Now, it, you know, the way you tell the story, it seems inevitable that um, you would tend to see uh, decreased production and a greater number of, of business failures under, in an inflationary environment. But that hasn't always been the right. macroeconomic theory, right? Right, right. right. Uh, can you account for that and explain how it is that economists came to believe that inflation was compatible with fast economic growth. Well, there's a naive view, and the naive view is that um, anytime you print more money and there's more, a greater spending in the economy, uh, well, then we have uh, you know greater wealth, greater money wealth, uh, and that's sort of just an illusion, of course. Um, in order to have gre greater prosperity in the economy, you have to have more goods, and more money does not automatically bring forth more goods. Right. Okay. But the, the more sophisticated view is that um, there's always a, a, a margin of unemployed resources, and that um, Increased spending will bring about a situation in which um, you'll raise some prices and that will make it more profitable to hire the unemployed labor to, to, to utilize the, the, the unused factory space and so mm -hmm, on. Mm -hmm. and, and that will then create prosperity. Uh, so in the second, more sophisticated case, they, they don't focus on printing a lot of money and dri just driving prices up. They focus on filling a deflationary gap, that is that Spending is just falling short of, 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 of the, the potential output of the economy um, at going prices. So you want to raise spending moderately to uh, allow all the goods that are being produced to be purchased by consumers so and an, by uh, investors. An inflationary recession is not so much an anomaly. It's, it's something you would just tend to ex ex expect. Yeah. At, at some point when prices begin to rise at rapid rates, rates that are politically unpopular or that the Fed does not want to... Um, continue, the Fed will stop inflating at, 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 at that rate of uh, increasing the money supply at that high rate, will cut back, interest rates will rise, and um, prices of investment goods will begin to fall, and we'll begin to see firms going out of business, laying off workers, in, mainly in the capital goods industry. Right. So, but you'll still have prices rising of consumer goods, because right. all the money has not been percolate, percolated through the economy, so you'll get an inflation as well as a recession, and that's known as the Austrian theory of the business or cycle. So -called Stagflation. Yeah, st or stagflation. Yeah. Uh, and how do non Austrian schools account for uh, stagflation? And non, non Austrian schools would account for stagflation um, as a result of an exogenous shock, what they call a shock from outside the economy. All of a sudden, oil prices rise. Yeah. So costs are higher, firms then produce less goods, so you have a recession, but at the same time, prices are going higher because yeah. the prices of the inputs are higher. Yeah. So they, they posit these sort of outside shocks that suddenly. Um, cause uh, these losses in the economy and, and reduction in output. So higher food prices, for example, um, is, is another example of, of, or another way in which the economy can uh, experience a stagflation. That doesn't sound like a very systematic theory at all. No, it really isn't. It's really an ad hoc theory to yeah. explain what happened in the 1970s, beginning in the 1970s. Now, Hazlitt was writing this book in 1946. What was happening um, in, in terms of uh, inflation in 1946 that caused him to zero in on this issue? Well, we had had price controls, um, as most wartime economies do, throughout World War II. And there was a big debate about how quickly to decontrol the U.S. economy. Uh, and there was fear that if prices were taken, uh, uh, price controls were removed, prices would rise. Um, and, in fact, they, they would rise, but the point is they'd be telling the truth about, yeah. about the relationship between um, the money supply and, and the amount of goods in the economy. And it would only be a one-time rise in prices. But, but, it would, but it would be very visible. Yeah. It's, it's just striking, though, that, that has a, a zero in on this point about inflation, given that we just went through this long period of, right. of history where, where there was a, a hysteria about deflation. Right. You know, And yet, uh, to Hazlitt's mind, uh, the inflation would pose the greatest danger. Yeah, he's actually, yeah, the other point is that um, in, in, in the demobilization of the economy and having more, more, uh, more people in the labor force, that is, the soldiers that were returning from Europe and, yeah. and the Japanese theater of war, there was a fear by mainstream economists that the economy would go into a depression yeah. um, because the government was spending less on war goods and, and less on, 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 on other things to clothe and feed the soldiers. But in fact, Hazlitt knew that if the government tried to offset this recession, uh, this, this um, uh, imminent, what they believe was an imminent 
um, depression with an increase of the money supply, uh, we would have now a peacetime inflation, yeah, which right. would distort prices and, and eventually cause misallocations and recession again. Do you think Hazlitt's uh, uh, explanation holds up? Yep, I trip? think it holds up today as, uh, as well as it did in 1946. Yeah. Well, very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Salerno. Okay, thank you, Jeff. My pleasure. This is Jeffrey Tucker. I'm here with another segment of our uh, systematic walk through uh, economics in one lesson, chapter by chapter. And now we're on the very last chapter, which is saving, a uh, chapter on saving, which is uh, packed with uh, information that's relevant to today's economic situations. And I have with me Roger Garrison at Auburn University, our uh, expert on business cycle and macroeconomics generally. Mm -hmm. Dr. Garrison. Thank you. Glad to talk about Hazlitt's book. Um, Okay, tell me about his chapter on saving. Um, perhaps you can begin with uh, where we were in 1946 when mm -hmm. he wrote this and why he wrote it. It's a great chapter. Uh, he, he talks about saving as, a, as sort of the essence of the problem of, of the economic thinking of the time. He doesn't mention John Maynard Keynes even once in that chapter. He uh, mentions very few names, but of course that's who he's talking about. Uh, Keynes was against saving. And, uh, because he thought it was spending that got us prosperity. And uh, Hazlitt was there to show us that uh, saving just shows up as spending in another form, in a more socially useful form at that. It seems strange that it would even be a controversy at all to say that saving is actually a good thing, since from an individual point of view, it's always a good thing. In fact, doesn't he tell something of a story that relates macroeconomics to individual Yes, the, yeah. yes, yes, the two brothers. Uh, right. Each inherited a good sum of money, and uh, one spends it on consumption, the other one spends very little and saves. And the popular view is that the one that spends is helping the community by creating jobs. But Hazlitt's point, of course, is the one that saves uh, is helping the community more by uh, funneling the saving through investment and increased growth in the economy and increased output in the future. And this again, returns to his theme of what is seen and unseen. That's right. That's right. Uh, it also, uh, what's involved here is is uh, the issue of whether the markets work or not. Uh, the, the economist, Keynes in particular, uh, who argued that uh, spending is good and saving is bad, uh, they argued that partly because they didn't think the market could transform saving into investment. And uh, Hez, uh, Hazlitt is just right on when he brings in the interest rate and identifies that as the market mechanism, as the, as the relevant price uh, that uh, translates saving into investment. The interest rate adjusts so that however much is saved is borrowed by the business community and spent uh, on investment projects, uh, creating output for the future. This, this error that consumption is the reason for economic growth it's still pervasive, isn't it? It is. It is. Uh, and it shows up uh, with these throat-clearing remarks on the news about uh, consumption is 70% uh, of the economy or whatever the current percentage yeah. is, uh, uh, as if that's what we need to pay attention to because that's what drives uh, the economy. It also goes back to Keynes' view that uh, all of the macro magnitudes move up and down together. And so... Uh, if you want to get the economy as a whole, uh, output as a whole to move up and down, well, work on consumption. That's the biggest component. Get it to move up. And, and that's because uh, Keynes wasn't thinking in terms of um, intertemporal coordination of that's economic right. forces. That's right. His his level of aggregation in his theory didn't allow him to deal with that issue at all. And so uh, consumption is now, saving is in the future, and uh, what what comes out. Uh, so anything we consume now comes out of the future. Mm -hmm. That's that's the idea, and the, and this model wasn't part of his thinking at all. Everything was right. simultaneous. Well, actually, according to Keynes, saving was just a leakage from the system. Uh, yeah, yeah. It even shows up in the early textbooks in Samuelson's textbook. Yeah. 
uh, for instance, as a, a hydraulic device where that has a leak, and what's leaking out is called saving. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't help the economy. But again, it's uh, it's the breakdown of the market in Keynes' view that uh, that gave him that result. He didn't think the interest rate functioned to coordinate saving and investment. And we still see, I guess, in '46 there were attacks on hoarding. That's uh, right. Especially in wartime, yeah. I, I, can't imagine what people must have been going through. Uh, That's right. That would be the first impulse. Would be to, if you get something, hold it. That's right. Yeah. And in, in, in some market conditions, there's good reason to hoard. Uh, yeah. Although hoarding is a pejorative term. It, yeah. I remember Murray Rothbard used to define hoarding as you holding more money than I think you ought to hold. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, everybody holds money, and they make their own choices about how much of it to hold. Uh, uh, Hazlitt indicates that. Uh, Hoarding is rarely the a root problem of any macroeconomic problem it, or any macroeconomic situation. It may well be that some people hoard more than others and that people hoard more at some times than others. But typically, if it's a problem, it's, it's triggered by some policy perversity that gave rise to it. The increasing uncertainty and risk and people respond. Sure. Yeah. And sure. of course, you never hold just to hold things forever. You hold with right. the intention to eventually consume in any case. That's right. Yeah. That's right. The same thing for savings, by the way, that, that the savings is treated as just a, a dead end. Yeah. Uh, even in modern macroeconomic theory, it's, it's pretty much a dead end. Uh, in the classroom, I like to use the expression saving up for something as opposed to simply saving yeah, to emphasize that people are building up purchasing power in order to exercise it sometime in the yeah. future. Now, this war on saving that uh, Hazlitt seems to identify, uh, it's been rather effective, hasn't it? Yes, <laughs> yes, I think it has. Uh, the, uh, uh, the lesson is well learned in that book, and that, and that uh, uh, savings does make its way into investment, and it does give rise to economic growth. And what's happened to savings over the years, and what's happening to savings right now? Savings in this country right now is at, a, at an all-time low. Uh, the statistics on saving out of income, as they express it, yeah. is essentially zero. Yes. Uh, that doesn't mean that nobody saves. It just means that a lot of people are spending more than they're earning, and in large part by uh, second mortgages, by, by mortgaging the uh, uh, the house and spending out of that. And yeah. so if you look at total spending, uh, it's about equal to total income, which means no saving out of income. Now, if I make some money and go and spend it on stocks, is that saving or consumption? Uh, well, buying the stocks is just is saving. And then uh, what the firm does with the funds, the firm that sold the stock, what they do with the funds is called investment. They buy uh -huh. uh, plant equipment, tools and machinery. Yeah. capital goods to increase future output. So as people uh, pull money out of the stock market, presumably that seems to be the trend right now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and put it into what? Some other uh, 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 riskless investment like government, mm -hmm. government bonds. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. that a, a tendency towards greater saving, or is it completely Well, that's a, no, that, that's, that's still saving. Uh, it's not such a hopeful saving if it's being channeled into the government rather than in the private sector. Yeah. But certainly in the statistics, if you look up statistics on saving, it doesn't distinguish between how much of that saving is, is borrowed by uh, firms and how much is borrowed by the government. Although we know that if the government borrows a hefty dose of it, that crowds out, that's the common term, it crowds out private sector activity. Yeah. And you end up with a less productive use of the saving. In an ideal world, um, uh, well, let me just ask it this way. Can you imagine a world in which there would be no such thing as uh, bonds, such as government bonds, that have absolutely no risk premium, that have a fixed return on them? Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. is, is that is that a world do you think we could we could live in? I don't think that's a world that could exist. And and in fact, uh, even with government bonds, it's not that there's no risk. It's just that the risk isn't borne by the people holding the bonds. Ah. The risk is borne. It's as if it was shut, shunted into the Atlantic Ocean, but of course it isn't. <laughs> it's shunted onto the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, who are responsible for cleaning up the mess once uh, once things get all fouled up. <laughs> and this relates to the business cycle, which 
I think Hazlitt very cleverly, or maybe it wasn't clever, it was just the way his narrative works. Mm -hmm. But in this chapter, he discusses the, the cause of the, of the business does. cycle. He does, and, and you can tell the whole story of the business cycle just by fo focusing on that loan market. That, uh -huh. uh, if, uh, if the interest rate is telling the truth, in other words, if it's actually reflecting people's willingness to save, then the economic growth we get is sustainable, is healthy growth. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's all good, but uh, if the interest rate uh, is distorted, in other words, is made to tell a lie, uh, and is too low, then the economy is set off on an unsustainable growth path, and uh, uh, eventually it all comes undone. That's the bust phase of the cycle. Does Hazlitt use the phrase uh, forced saving here? I don't think he does. Yeah. The, the concept is there for sure. Mm -hmm. The term itself, uh, uh, has been used to mean many different things, even among the Austrian economists. Mm -hmm. And it's not surprising that uh, Hazlitt, who has a reputation for being such a clear writer, and that's one of the things that characterizes this book, uh, would avoid that term. Okay, Not because he disagrees with the concept, but because there are uh, clearer ways of expressing the ideas, which he does very nicely. Mm -hmm. you, you might say rather illusory saving or imaginary saving, or how would you put it? Well, uh, Hayek uh, uh, called it a policy-induced investment, policy-induced okay. capital accumulation. Uh -huh. In other words, what's, what's called for saving is really a form of investment. It's, yeah. it's committing resources to early stages of production uh, that can't be completed because, uh, because there's no genuine saving to see them through yeah. the process. So what you're speaking about is a pure model of, uh, of an Austrian uh, business cycle. But every business cycle is different, right? Yes. Uh -huh. right. So you can't expect the same features from everyone. That's true. Yeah. That's true. In fact, uh, what, what tends to happen is, is that uh, business cycles tend to ride piggyback on whatever happens to be going on at the time. Uh -huh. And uh, here, we, here we can see uh, similarity and differences between current situation and, and earlier situations. For instance, in the 1920s, there were technological innovations, uh, mass production of automobiles in the chemical industry and in uh, processed food because of electrification and all that. And uh, the artificially low interest rate just uh, uh, caused an increase there beyond what could actually be sustained. Okay, so you got a, a boom of that sort. In the uh, 1990s, uh, you had a digital revolution going on, a yeah. genuine digital re revolution. But the lower interest rate under the Clinton administration uh, just uh, magnified that beyond what could be sustained. Okay, And so now we have a similar thing. The difference is that it's not, it's not something that's going on in the market that got amplified, but some policy perversity, namely subsidizing home ownership, yeah. uh, which was a perversity in and of itself, but it got even amplified further by the increase in the money supply and the low interest rate. Well, you know, I, th I think that's an excellent insight, and it helps account for and this this point that that the new credit that the business cycle sort of pig piggybacks on whatever happens to be going on. At that's the time. true, and that's that's what makes them different. Okay, and that's partially what accounts for the theory that uh, the cause of the business cycle is some sort of uh, technological shock. Right. That's, a, right. that's also an illusion, isn't uh -huh. it? Because oh, sure. it, it's confusing cause and effect, or it's mis misidentifying the causal factors. That's true. That's true. And it also derives from the fact that uh, the Federal Reserve uh, adopts this real bills doctrine, which uh, suggests that they supply credit at currently available interest rates, which, which essentially uh, it causes them to pump money into credit markets when there's an increased demand for credit rather than let the interest rate adjust uh, to that new market condition. Is there any way to know for sure whether or not the interest rate that the Fed is uh, seeking to achieve mm -hmm. um, is the correct one or mm -hmm. not? No, actually there isn't. And, and, but, that's, but that's not at all surprising. In the same sense, there's, there would have been no way in the Soviet Union to figure out what the price of shoes ought to be yeah. if the government, if only the government is creating shoes. So you can't say, well, it's too market, high, it's too low. You're you need a market to tell you what the price of shoes would be, and you need a decentralized banking system to tell you what the interest rate should be. Okay, so uh, your proposal then isn't for the Fed to do a better job at what it does. Right. 
it's to have it stop doing what it's doing and yes, let the we, market do it. Right, right. We need decentralized banking. <laughs> okay. And this is a, a, a position that has that endorses or, or not? He doesn't get into that. He yeah. doesn't get into that. Uh, the, the spirit of Hazlitt suggested he well might. Yeah, very good. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Garrison. Thank you. Thank you.